Okay, good morning, Morro Bay. Uh, my name is Steve Allen. Um, I am the vice chair of the Tourism Business Improvement District Advisory Board. Um, to my right, Chris Kosteka, Joan Solu, and on my left, Nancy Dickerson. Uh, we're hoping that I believe Isaac Sue is still going to join us this morning. Do we have a quorum? We have a quorum? Okay. And I believe um, Amish Patel is not going to make it today. Right. Neither is Terry. Okay. Um, let's start this morning um, with a moment of silence. Please rise and join me in uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That's always a great way to start the morning. Um, so Jennifer is not here, so you can help me. Do we, what are we starting with? We're going to start with elections of um, chair and vice chair. Okay. Nominations. So any nominations? Do we have any nominations? I nominate Stephen Allen to be chair and Chris Kostaka to be vice chair. Any other nominations? I nominate Steve Allen to be chair and Amish Patel, who can't speak for himself today, as vice chair. <laughs> How does that work if they're not present? You can, they can still be elected. They can still be elected. I second Nancy's motion. <laughs> <laughs> I second Joan's motion. <laughs> Uh, as long as we have so many volunteers, I'm, you know, I, I don't, I'm happy with whatever. Um, the issue that I have this year on becoming vice chair is, um, for example, I will not be here next month. I'm working very hard to make sure that I can be here for the rest of them, but there's potential that I will miss a few meetings this year and don't feel that I can give the time necessary. Also, we're trying to just be up here for one week a month and not as much activity in between. So if I could hold off on that for maybe one more year, that would uh, be nice. Well, then I retract my motion. Is it okay? Can I retract my motion? I retract my motion. Are there any concerns with Amish attendance? Do we, have, has anyone spoken to him about this? We have. He's okay? He said he'd think about it. Oh. <laughs> and then he was told that he doesn't, he can't just think about it. <laughs> yes, to say yes. Yeah, my understanding is that Amish is okay with this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so do we, what do you need? Do we, a second? You have a second? Do you have, want to take a vote? Sure. Okay, so all in favor of. Steve Allen becoming chair, and then Amesh Patel becoming vice chair. Say aye. 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 Opposed. Opposed? None. Okay. Congratulations, everyone. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, thank you. Um, no, it is kind of surreal. Everyone I started off with on this board is gone now. Um, so, circle of life. It does happen, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, we're going to transition now into um, any board member announcements. I have an announcement, if you would humor me. It's Megan's birthday today. And so thank you, Megan. Happy birthday. And we appreciate everything you do. And thank you for spending time in our meeting with us on your birthday. And, you know, go off and just have another great, great year. And you're, you can run this year, so. Thank you. I second that. <laughs> <laughs> any other board member announcements? Seeing none, um, any staff announcements? Yes, I have a couple. Can I actually stand up? Thank you. 
perfect. So I'm just going to bring you a little bit up to speed on vacation rental onboarding. So we are still in the middle of outreach. Um, vacation rentals have until the end of February to re opt out if they would like to not be included on morobay.org. Thank you. Um, so far, we have 33 um, properties that have opted out of the 263. Um, the yard sale is coming up, beginning of April. We have applications rolling in already. Last year, we utilized the yard sale treasure map app um, for visitors to help plan routes and find all the yard sales. We're going to do that again this year. Last year, we cut down the number of printed maps from 10,000 to 2,000, and we still had quite a few left over. So this year, our plan is to print 500 and then to go fully green um, next year with having no printed maps. And then an update on the numbers for the Foodies Wanted campaign, which is our food and beverage digital um, passport this year. So, so far, in less than two months, there have been 1,025 offers downloaded, and the page on Eventbrite has been viewed over 1,000 times, which is pretty good numbers. Um, just for reference, last year, over three months, the total redemptions was, were 376 for the passport. And then we have some new signs. So we have new moralbay.org signs um, over the two major entries into town. Um, so one is on Highway 1 and Yerba Buena, as seen here. And the other one is off of Highway 41 and Ironwood. So it's good to get tourists um, directed to moralbay.org right away to get the information that they need when they're coming into town. And those are all the announcements I have at the moment. Thank you. Um, Megan, yes. I, this may not be the perfect time to bring this up, but I'm not sure if it'll come again. Um, maybe under uh, comments. Ran into Jen or spoken to her in casual. And a, a sense that I'm getting with the um, vacation rentals coming on board is that we may be looking to adjust all our marketing in, in maybe too far a ways. Let me step back on that. I'm still of the belief that vacation rentals and hotel guests are all guests coming to this town. And for some reason, they chose Morro Bay to come. Mm -hmm. So if they're staying in a home, they didn't pick that home because it has low rent or whatever. They're coming on a vacation. So I think we should offer amenities and programs and events that cater to all mm -hmm. and not say, oh, that may not be of interest to vacation rentals, so let's scrap that. Or let's no longer have handouts maybe available because it's difficult for vacation rentals. I think maybe we don't hand deliver to hotels, but we do allow them available in your offices for hotels, vacation rentals, whoever to come pick up. I would like to think that our marketing is still geared towards the tourist and we just put blinders as to where they're staying. They're, they're staying somewhere in Morro Bay, they're a guest here in the city, and we mark it as such. I don't think we have to overthink it. So uh, as you're coming up with programs for us in the future, um, if you don't agree with that idea or if I'm missing something, you know, if you let us know as a board. Or I would like the board's thoughts on that also. And I just wanted to make a quick comment, too. So the idea behind the digital passports this year was that they were open to a broader audience, I guess, um, in the sense that you didn't have to have proof that you were staying at a hotel like we do for our wine coupons and stuff like that. So it was, a, in our heads, a way to include those people who were staying in vacation rentals. Just wanted to kind of explain where you're coming from. And I like that. I think that's great. I did hear that we are considering not doing the wine promotion mm -hmm. based upon concerns of vacation rentals. Um, I guess that's where my concern came from that. I don't see why that would not be a good promotion for vacation rentals also. Mm -hmm. I think, and I do think online is wonderful, but maybe we do consider having cards printed up, um, Estero Inns printed up their own cards, directing them to that page for that reason. People like to receive something. Um, not sure exactly how they find it if they don't receive some sort of prodding to go to that site. Yeah. Um, I know Maggie's here today. She may even have a take on the vacation rental part of that, but I don't see why wine wouldn't be of interest mm -hmm. also to vacation rental people. I, I'm, there's a disconnect for me that I'm not seeing why that would not be a good promotion. I agree with you in concept, Chris. I think a lot of this, you know, the, the dust needs to settle a little bit, and I think that's why we're looking forward to having uh, 
you know, a member from the vacation rental industry here on the board with us. Um, but as we move along, maybe we can talk about more specific, you know, hotel versus vacation rental items. But I agree with you, people staying in a vacation rental drink wine too, right? Great. So again, I, I, just a comment, I agree with you as well, except one of the laws of marketing is if you market generically to everyone, you market to no one. The power of marketing is targeting. And so I think we're learning about the differences between hotel rentals and uh, vacationers and um, VR. And I think that we should be open to learning about the targeting and then consider from that point as to whether it's important for us to have some um, targeted VR promotions as well. I think we still need to learn, but I think keep in mind that um, you don't want plain vanilla marketing. It doesn't work. You, targeted marketing is what makes people feel like, oh, this is for me, and they come. And I think one of the problems of our marketing in the past has been that it's been too generic. Yeah, I, I, I agree with everything that's being said up here. I feel like... Um, Sometimes the targets can be different, so it doesn't mean that the marketing has to be the same. Yeah. So sometimes we might market for hotel guests, and sometimes we might market for vacation rental guests, and that doesn't mean that the promotion will be exactly the same. They can be tailored. I mean, n not all of us walk into the store and buy a size medium. So we, we need to make sure that we're tailoring to what the need is of the, the guests. But yes, that's, I think we're getting into maybe a discussion. I don't know. Yeah. Good stuff. So we've got a lot of ground to cover this morning. Um, Councilman uh, Davis is going to give us an update, I believe, on the advisory board handbook and bylaws. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I think you all have a copy of the current Advisory Bodies Handbook and Bylaws. Yes. And uh, I'll just go through some of the uh, the basic parts of it and some changes. What? Well, thank you, Mr. City Manager. Okay. Um, <clears throat> just to start with, the um, advisory body members are appointed by the council. Um, and you help the council by creating public forums so that the community can come and give you input that the, you can then um, discuss, filter, and pass on to council in the form of recommendations and information. So the, um, the handbook and the bylaws were adopted in 2002 to help you understand your role. And um, this past year, the council established a subcommittee to, re to review the, uh, the handbook and make some changes, and we adopted those changes in, uh, in December. So, so one of the, the basic parts of your job and our job is to develop jointly a work plan, and that's based on city goals and objectives that we set every two years. Uh, we will start next year in January with our two-year uh, council goals for the city, and then we will ask for your input into the work plan, or into the goals, and then uh, as part of our goals process, we then develop work plans for each of the advisory bodies and we give that back to you. And we ask you to work on specific tasks uh, during the, the following two years uh, with some goals and uh, timetables. And of course, other things may come up during the, the year that we would ask you to work on as well and add to your work plan. Sometimes, as you have experienced, uh, something that's a little more complex will require extra work, and you can establish a subcommittee. And I think you did that with uh, including the short-term rentals into the uh, uh, into the jurisdiction of of the TBID. Um, and there are some guidelines for establishing your subcommittee. One is it has to be smaller than a quorum. So in your case, that would be no more than three members working on the subcommittee. And of course, you need to define the purpose. 
the parameters and the duration and then um, receive a report back which you would then uh, discuss and provide recommendations to the council. One of the things that is important for your body to consider is the impact of your requirements on staff. Um, there are a couple of things involved there. Staff is already booked to the maximum with goals that the council has adopted at the beginning of the year. Anything that you add to their uh, time requirements then requires them to reduce their work in some other area. So uh, you need to reach an understanding with staff when you ask them for help, particularly with subcommittee um, requirements. And you also need to remember that the staff does not work directly for you. They work with you, but they are under the direction of the city manager. Um, it's also good whenever you are communicating with staff or with the council that you send your information through your chair. Um, it works better if there's a single point of contact rather than individual board members uh, talking to staff or to council and perhaps carrying uh, messages that are not uh, coordinated. And then there are um, occasionally you will be asked to make written reports or recommendations to the council. And again, that's based on your work plan or on what you hear from the community during your regularly scheduled meetings. And something you should remember is that you do not speak for the city, uh, particularly when you speak to outside agencies. Um, you speak as individuals expressing your individual opinions perhaps, but um, don't speak for the city or for the committee as a whole if, if you are not truly representing the committee. And then your recommendations to the council should be follow the, the particular for, uh, formal format of motion, second, discussion, and a vote for adoption, and then the chair would forward your recommendations to the council. Whenever one of your members appears before the council or in front of another advisory body, you should explain in advance that you are speaking as a member of the public and that you're not representing the opinions of your uh, advisory body. Um, and then if you are making statements about a matter that is within um, your advisory body's jurisdiction, you should not speak if a majority of your body is present at the meeting. So if four of you are in an audience at a council meeting and one of you gets up to speak, um, you should not talk about TBID matters because then that becomes construed as a, a quorum being present and presenting a conclusion. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's good, because that's kind of a difficult one for me to, to grasp. 
Um, and then the just some administrative details. The uh, the T bid meets nine times a year, each month January through June, and then August, September, and October. And then your absences from a, a regular meeting are handled at the board level. You no longer need to come to council to get permission to miss a meeting. Um, and just notify staff and the chair that you need to meet a meeting, you need to miss a meeting, and then uh, the approval will be granted by the advisory body. Um, and staff is responsible for monitoring attendance because if a member misses three consecutive regular meetings or 25% of the regular meetings during the year um, without consent of council, that constitutes a resignation. So attendance is important. Can we ask questions? Oh, sure, please. Okay. So, if three meetings in a row, but you would be at 25% if you hit two meetings in a row. It, it's just math. The, yes. the mathematics are off. <laughs> That's, yes. So, I don't know. I, so, still it's three meetings or it's two? Well, it's Who knows? both. <laughs> it's... With, that is a generic guideline, okay. uh, and typically um, geared toward uh, bodies that meet 12 times a year. So, yes, both of those would still be true. Well, I have to say that I am... Um, impressed with staff making these regular staff reports because this is more difficult than I thought it was going to be. Huh? Oh, yeah. I'm, I don't even know which slide I'm on. Um, okay, and then... The, the procedure for, uh, for holding your meetings is the same as what the council follows, and, and I think you know that. Um, you establish a quorum, a call to order, moment of silence, pledge of allegiance, announce, uh, committee announcements and presentations, um, staff announcements and presentations, and then public comment period for, uh, for general items, the consent calendar, business items, and then at the end of the meeting, uh, future agenda items, which requires a majority of support in order to add an agenda item to the next meeting, or to a future meeting, and then the notification of the, the next meeting and adjournment. Um, and then uh, for discussion of the items on the agenda, typically there's presentation of the staff report, which is what I'm doing, and then you get to follow with your questions to clarify what was in the report, and then the chair opens for public comment on that particular item. Then your committee discusses the item, um, and then uh, follows, um, and then takes appropriate action uh, staff will make a recommendation and will also give some alternatives and of course you also have the latitude to devise your own alternatives. Um, and then a motion, second, discussion, vote, and then move on. Um, we encourage you to uh, allow three minutes for public comments which is the general practice. And of course, we engage in civil behavior and discourse. 
And in fact, we have a resolution 27-18, wherein we, we pledge to follow the best practices of civil discourse. Aha. Okay. <clears throat> and as you can see by the slide that's on the board now, remember that you are a, a, a public um, board that conducts its business in accordance with the Brown Act. So there are some things that are involved with that. One is the city gives you an email that is specific to your function as a board member and we encourage you to use that email account in conducting all of your city business. If you start using your personal account, then your personal account becomes subject to public records requests and everything you've ever written is going to be um, subject to being publicized. So confine your, your emails to using your email account. Um, and be careful about how you address your fellow members, your board members. If you write an email to a majority of your board members, that can be construed as a violation of, of um, the public meeting requirements of, of your uh, function. Um, and just remember, anything that you write in your email is subject to uh, public records requests, and you might see it in the newspaper. Um, one of the requirements of a public person is that you file a Form 700 um, every year. And of course, Heather can help you do that. Um, you can do it online, and sometimes that works. Um, or you can do it manually. Also, we are all required to do ethics training. Um, within a year of assuming office and every two years after that, and also harassment prevention training within six months of office and every two years after that. And typically, um, our city attorney will set up uh, a couple of dates in the beginning of the calendar year, and you can schedule yourself to do that. And I think there's an alternative. You can do it online, and you can work with Heather if you need to do that. So we've reached the best part now. In closing, <laughs> advisory body members are encouraged to review and abide by the advisory body's handbook and bylaws. And if you need clarification, you can contact staff or me because I am your liaison, which doesn't mean that I have any authority over you at all. I am simply a communication conduit if the rest of the council has particular questions about uh, decisions that you have made. You should also familiarize yourselves with the Brown Act, the Public Records Act, and the Political Reform Act, which has to do with conflict of interest in the Form 700. You need to file your, your Form 700s, attend the legally required training, and please use only the city email accounts for official city business. So I'll open now for questions. Any questions? I have one. It's common practice to text. Text, you know, can you make a meeting at 4 p.m. for the yeah. subcommittee? Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing about texting in here, and I'm just wondering how, you know, how you handle, like, do we need to forward those to our city email accounts so that those are part of the record, those kinds of things? I don't think that you need to copy anybody on your text on staff, but you need to be aware that as soon as you text another public member, that means your texts are subject to, subject to public records requests. And sometimes <clears throat> that can mean your entire device is subject to 
PRAs. So it's just something to keep in mind. Anything else? Well, thank you, Councilman Davis. That was 20 pounds you fit into a 10-pound sack. So um, the online training, I have to say, was great. They set that up for me, the ethics and the harassment training. I'm having my whole um, managerial staff take that, too. I think it's just it's a really good resource. Um, appreciate that. And Scott, I think you have your next on the announcements. Speak directly uh, yeah, I'll try it. I'll try to re replicate that masterpiece presentation. <laughs> one, one moment. Okay, Scott Collins, city manager here. I uh, also have Rob Livick, our public works director, fill in blanks, answer the hard questions. Um, so uh, several meetings ago, I believe now Chair Allen had asked a question about the water and sewer rates um, and had requested that staff come back and give a presentation on the rates uh, and kind of why they're so high. Um, and uh, so we put together a presentation for you and um, the title of the recommend of the, sorry, of the PowerPoint presentation is the wharf project and water and sewer fees. And those two are inextricably linked. So it's important that um, we talk about the project and the rates together. So moving on into the presentation, um, why did the city need a new plant? Um, not gonna go into all those biological readings, but um, in short, we failed to meet the basic level of treatment requirements to discharge into the ocean um, per the Water Quality Control Act. Um, and we've known that for quite some time. The city has grappled with this project for at least 16 years, maybe prior to. We knew we were on the clock from the state and federal regulators regarding water quality. Um, they also understand that um, building a new project or rehabbing a project of this size in a community of our size and economics is challenging. So they've given extensions upon extensions while we work as a community to come up with a solution. Um, they finally called, called in the cards and said, you have one last shot, you know, initiated a time schedule order, which means we have until the beginning of 2023 to have a functioning plant that discharges the, the right combination of water and other things into the ocean to meet the water, water quality control goals and, uh, or face up to $50,000 in fines per month. So um, it's a pretty heavy hammer uh, to face. And so we were issued that in 2018, which gave us five years to get a project built. Um, meanwhile, the community has been going through a lot of discussions, um, starting out in 2007, looking at a rehab of the project, being notified by um, Coastal Commission that probably should consider a project that's inland. Um, the city proceeded anyhow forward with a rehab project that included some flood control protections. Um, that made it all the way to the Coastal Commission in 2013 where the project was denied, the permit was denied to kind of rebuild the project on its current location. The city looked at the current location primarily for cost purposes. Uh, you know, it's all the infrastructure is right there. Um, but from the Coastal Pr Commission's perspective in 2013, um, with climate change becoming uh, an issue du jour at the time uh, and being within close proximity to the ocean and not a lot of barriers between itself and the ocean, uh, a good idea is to move it inland. And so the city took a new course after that time to um, look, look for alternate sites. Um, and also in that ruling by the Coastal Commission, they um, stated that the city really had to make a better effort to do water reclamation. Um, this was pre-drought era, but um, nonetheless, Coastal Commission has a, a different horizon than most cities in terms of how they view things and felt it was appropriate that the city really consider a water reclamation component um, and to, to reuse that water. Uh, so, um, with that in mind, the city went, went through a pretty lengthy process. Uh, they formed a citizen advisory committee to help assist the city in looking at alternative locations across the highway, looking at different treatment levels, looking at water reclamation options, 
and also helping city council uh, engage the public and come up with project goals. Um, clearly moving inland is going to bring in another level of cost burden to the community. So ratepayer expense was a top priority. Um, communicating the goals uh, to the community was another priority. Producing higher level um, treatment was another priority. Uh, augmenting the city's water supply because by this time when we were getting really serious, we were in the middle of you know, a pretty historic drought back in 2015-16 time frame. Um, and the city was really serious about reclamation, and Rob will talk a little bit more about that. Um, and include uh, secure funding or grant opportunities that can help reduce rate impacts, uh, and also consider neighbor neighboring uses in, in terms of compatibility, not locating a power, uh, wastewater plant in the middle of a neighborhood. All those things led to initial price tag of $167 million back in 2017. And City Council rightfully took a pause at that time because that number was extraordinary and initial um, cost uh, rate estimates had it almost a $300 a month bill for, for residential on an average water use and on a completely unacceptable uh, level. And so City Council, with the help of our Public Works Director, formed a peer advisory committee of other public work professionals. They came up with a laundry list of suggestions to help reduce the cost of the project. That helped bring it down to 150 million. And then we worked with the uh, Environmental Protection Agency uh, on their WIFIA program to get low, low interest loan financing, um, created a sort of innovative design build contract um, to help get sort of guarantees on what the cost of the major components of the project would be. And that got us down to $126 million. Uh, Rob will pro can answer some of your questions about potable reuse, but one of the key considerations of this project is being able to inject um, indirect potable reuse water. Um, highly treated water goes into an injection well system. It sits for the requisite amount of time, and it's drawn upon into our water system for, for potable re reuse. Um, pretty innovative. There are projects that have done this, so we wouldn't be the first, but certainly we're on the cutting edge. Um, the nice thing about this is that it could offset about 80% of our water needs, potable water needs. And as we look at this current year, the state allocation for, for water, and we're 90% dependent on state water for our water, um, they're projecting maybe l less than a 30% allocation to, to all of its users. We have a drought buffer for years like this, but that only lasts so long. And so you could, under, under a prolonged drought situation, the city could have less than what it needs for water, which obviously has a significant impact on residents and heavy water users like hotels and restaurants. So we wanted to make sure we get the most value for a project that's going to cost that amount of money. Um, and the other thing about recycled water is that it makes us uh, eligible for loan, low interest loan programming and grants. Um, we already are qualified and almost ready to sign with the WIFIA program, which will save us approximately $28 million in debt service because the interest rate is around 2.4% versus the conventional loan, which is over three now. Um, and we're working on uh, another low interest loan with the state for the state rolling fund, which could help us save another $32 million in debt savings. Definitely worth it. So if you, if you sort of were to take out the reclamation component of the project, um, the rates would essentially be the same, but then you wouldn't have that benefit of an insurance policy if droughts become significant and long lasting. So again, here's a, here's a look at the, the SRF um, funding and the WIFIA, which is the Water Infrastructure Finance and Innovation Act of 2016. Um, so what went into the rate study, which was done in 2018, um, there's the, the wharf project itself, um, starting to invest in our sewer and water pipe needs, and then operations and maintenance to ensure that we have a fully functioning utility program. Uh, at the time when we did the rate study, we, we only were certain that we would have WIFIA alone, but not the state revolving fund. So we projected that uh, a good 20 to $30 million would be borrowed on conventional loans. So there may be some potential 
for rate collecting less than the full amount of authorized rates. So what that translates into English is that you could, in the future, maybe pay less than you pay now, um, depending on how those rates turn out and how the project costs move forward. Uh, we did form a Blue Ribbon Commission of four members of our community who are very talented and experienced in the financial world or business world, and they helped us to develop rates that um, could be as reasonable as possible given the sheer cost of the project of $126 million. So we thank all four of those members uh, for their work and their recommendations to council, which were ultimately uh, moved forward into the Prop 218 process, which was conducted in, in late 2018. Um, so this chart right here shows residential rates and what the wharf surcharge did to rates. Um, it's also important to note that there was a rate increase in 2015 for a, a total of four year, five years. Um, prior to the 2015, the water rates hadn't been increased for 20 years. So I don't know how many of you who've run businesses haven't didn't increase your cost for 20 years or your prices. Um, maybe there was good reasons for that, but the city did have a lot of catching up to do. Um, our debt service ratios were upside down, and um, in order to stay good with the state water project, we needed to increase our water rates and at the same time begin to plot a, a course to be able to fund a new uh, water treatment and sewer treatment plant. So the war surcharges for residents was $41 per month. Um, that will carry through the entire um, debt service of the project for 30 or 35 years, depending. So this just gives you an idea of, of the residential, and obviously you're more concerned about the commercial, which I'll let Rob discuss. Um, on, the, on the residential side, it's pretty straightforward. The sewer charge is a flat rate. And then on the residential water side, there is there are tiered systems. The more you use, you get into a higher classification, you're going to pay a higher rate for each incremental uh, water unit consumed. Um, but the sewer charges and water charges for non-residential are a little more confusing. So I'll let Rob explain that. Thank you, board um, chair, um, committee. Um, Water and sewer rates um, um, for non-residential customers are uh, basically based on the amount of water that is used. And on the sewer side, the strength of the sewage. So there's basically um, four classifications for sewer strength going from um, something that might be less than residential to a high strength um, user. So somebody that has um, lots of stuff um, in their wastewater. So perhaps a um, commercial laundry or um, uh, large restaurant facilities. Um, it's based on the biological content of, of, the, of the wastewater. So the BOD or biological oxygen demand and total suspended solids is how strength is established. So those strength factors, um, the higher strength uh, wastewater you have, the higher cost uh, that you will incur. It is also flow based so that the more water you use results in more wastewater, so the higher costs. Um, that in a nutshell is how the um, um, commercial um, rates were established. Sorry, I said four rates. There's five um, uh, sewer rates. Uh, we have very few users in the um, highest, high strength uh, waste, wastewater um, rates. So there's, um, for, um, for the smallest of the commercial users, it, um, there's a minimum charge and that's basically equal to um, that um, average residential charge. So uh, the smallest of the commercial users will pay about 100, for combined water and wastewater, about $191 um, dollars a month. And then the larger will pay incrementally um, more um, for uh, wastewater. We have looked, um, took a couple of examples of, uh, let's say, a um, hotel with no restaurant that might have 
you know, 30 to 35 rooms that uses about 150 units of water a month on average. Um, their um, total um, water sewer bill combined would be a little over $5,000 a month. And a restaurant that might seat um, about 120 people um, that has an average uh, monthly water use of about um, 101 units, and a unit is um, 100 cubic feet or 748 gallons, so quite a bit of water. Um, they would have a um, average um, monthly bill of about um, $2,500 a month. And you, we did look at um, um, our um, neighbors to see how that compares to uh, neighboring rates. Let's say the same um, hotel project was in Cayucas, that same um, 30 to 35 unit hotel um, um, that had the same water use um, using CSD sewer and CSA 10, which is the um, county water provider in um, Cayucas, they would have a combined monthly bill of about um, 41, almost $4,200 a month. And the, the same restaurant would be 27. So the hotel is a little bit less, the restaurant is a little bit more um, because they calculate their rates a little bit differently. Um, not all agencies are both water and sewer providers. So um, Cayucas for their sewer bill can't use water consumption because they don't have access to that water use. So it's based on equivalent residential units um, or um, how many, um, if that hotel could be compared to a residence, how many houses would that equal to? And a um, based on water use, that hotel would be about 30 houses. Um, and the restaurant would be about 20 houses, use of water. In Los Osos, um, um, they do things even a little bit differently than that. It's based on the square footage of the property, commercial property. In Los Osos, that same hotel would pay about $4,800 a month, and the uh, restaurant would pay about $2,400 a month. So you can see they're within the same order of magnitude, although we are um, a little bit higher than our neighbors. Um, reason for that, um, increased costs. Um, what we're providing in Morro Bay is significantly um, a higher level of service. We're getting a water supply benefit um, from our project. Um, Los Osos and Cayucas, um, while they're looking to water reclamation in the future to offset costs, um, they're not they don't have water reclamation that directly benefits their uh, water supply as we're proposing um, with our project. And that water supply benefit does come at a cost. The reason we need that water supply benefit, as Scott alluded to, um, we are almost re entirely reliant on our state water project. Um, we entered into a contract in the 90s to contract for 1,313 acre feet a year, which is over what uh, Morro Bay needs currently, but uh, protects us to build out. Um, in the 90s, state water was seen as the unending, uninterruptible water supply from the north. Um, that hasn't always been the case. We've received as little as 5% of our allocation, and we're only protected because of our drought buffer. If the state ever goes down to 0% allocation, our drought buffer does not protect us, and we need to have more than one um, water source in Morro Bay. We have two groundwater basins that um, we, have we have water permits for. We don't have a water right um, for. One is in the Mora Valley and one is in the Choro Valley. Both have water quality issues with them. High nitrate due to upstream agriculture. The water reclamation project helps to 
um, ameliorate that um, um, water quality issue in the Morro Basin. Um, when council adopted the, um, our um, planning document for water and sewer, um, direction was to divest ourselves over time from the Choro Valley um, water supply. That was seen as basically unaffordable to uh, provide the treatment to remove those nitrates and del deliver that water to Morro Bay. Um, uh, I've gone into a little bit more detail uh, into rates than um, um, just the rates themselves, but um, I'll stop here in case the um, board has any questions. Go ahead. So I wish this chart here had the list of what class or who falls into each class, not who what type of commercial business falls into each class. Um, I was looking for it online, but I, I can't find it because it's, it's hard to do very quickly and still cue into what you're saying. Um, because then we could better easily, th there's not a connectivity, I think, between this chart and the commercial user. If this had the actual classification listed on there, for example, I know that restaurants are in class E, the highest strength, full service restaurants. So that's the galley, windows on the water, all the low lows, those guys are all in there. Hotels are, I believe, and that's what I was trying to find for everyone here, are moderate to high strength. Is that correct, Mr. Leivik? It, it depends if the hotel has a restaurant or not. Then they could fall into higher, higher strength uh, classification if the hotel has a restaurant or not. There's only one, one. so that would be the inn at Morro Bay, right? Correct. So, so they would maybe fall into E, but the rest of the hotels are classified as D? Is D. that correct? D, like dog. D. Okay, got you. Um, so the reason I'm asking that is because well, I just want to explain to folks here, or have, maybe have you explain how um, the combination of D, what the water surcharge is per unit, because I think in talking to folks out there, that's commercial folks, I mean, that's where the confusion is for them. They see $5.43 and think $5.43, but it's actually a combination of $5.43 and $3.64 on the water surcharge side. So it's $9.17 per unit used in combination. Um, yes. So uh, on strength only um, affects um, sewer use. It doesn't affect the water bill. So water bill is purely based on the amount of use, no matter what type of business that you have. So on the sewer side, because we base our rates on the amount of water that is used as adjusted by the sewer strength that um, that business might um, deliver um, to the wastewater treatment plant, um, that's how those rates are established. So you are correct. Different businesses have, you know, an office um, is different from a um, hotel, um, a um, uh, water treatment, um, a Culligan type business is different from an office because uh, uh, they're almost delivering almost just water back to, back to, to the system. So um, that's how those strengths and I think you're right. I think it would help um, businesses understand if not only the strength were listed because, you know, class A, does that really mean anything to anybody? No. Not, uh, you need to list out. the types of businesses uh, for each classification, which is listed on the, um, on the, uh, both on the Prop 218 notice and our rate uh, schedule that we use internally. Um, not so easy to, um, um, uh, find on public, like this document, which is on, on the website. Even the water and sewer active, water and sewer rate calculator, which is phenomenal. I'm so glad we got there on online. It's so awesome to have that active 
water and sewer rate calculator because I've had folks ask me, I've sent them the link to it, and they, because they can't figure out what their classification is, I get the call back, can you, you, know, can you help me? Um, but uh, it does allow them to see that, A, they, they, there's a perception that they're being overcharged because they don't combine the, they don't, they don't combine the two, uh, the water surcharge and the sewer surcharge right. to come up with the full surcharge, plus the standing monthly charge that's on there, which is, I have to put my glasses on for it, minimum monthly charge of $12.80 for the water surcharge for commercial, and a minimum monthly charge of $20, no matter what, in addition, so that's all combined on there, and that's how it's calculated. Does that help, it helps you to understand how it's calculated, but it doesn't, I guess, help to understand how it can be yeah, currently to, to determine what strength that you're being billed, unless you already know, um, would be to call our um, water billing um, staff and um, have them look up your account and let you know what uh, classification that you're in. Um, um, I don't believe that occurs on um, the bills. I think on the new bills, it, it, we have a, on there, but on the old bills, by looking at your bill, you couldn't determine what strength you were. You're correct. Yeah. Big improvements on the bills. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Actually, I do have another question. Along the Embarcadero, we have several public restrooms. And on new building projects, uh, I believe Doug Redekin has one. And uh, I don't know the name of the projects that are coming forward. I'm sorry, there's like two or three hotel projects coming forward that are combined with uh, lower, the lower floor is retail and restaurant, I believe. And then there's going to be a public restroom on there. When those projects go through planning, is it advised by city staff that the public restroom be placed, have its own meter placed on it? And the reason why I ask that is because if it's connected to the restaurant, then it's at the highest, it's at the highest strength sewer charge. And those restrooms get hundreds of flushes during the day, during tourist season. And that would, so public restrooms are, on the lowest, they're class A, versus being the highest, class E, is thousands of dollars on your water and sewer bill. So if we are suggesting that businesses or leaseholders or anyone in the community have a public restroom, maybe we should suggest that those have a separate water meter so that they can be metered at the public restroom, charged on a separate bill at the public restroom metering strength to save money. Does that make sense? Uh, can I piggyback on that? Uh, try to separate personal from this board, but we, we fall into that category. Okay. Uh, the Estero Inn, we have a public restroom. And that has been a continual concern of ours. I haven't brought it up yet. Um, I like her idea, except I think a separate metering would be quite expensive front end on that meters five thousand dollars but maybe there could be another class because she is correct in the summertime i believe that upwards of one half of our water usage is that bathroom we get tour buses that park in front of our hotel and they walk out one after another with a line into that bathroom so you take eight hotel rooms where the guests are flushing the toilet once or twice a day as opposed to a couple hundred flushes on that bathroom uh it, it's a killer and so I don't know what other hotels have that problem, but our water bills have more than doubled in the last year. Um, so there would be nice if that was brought up. I know you have a million things to worry about on that, but that is, I know for the dozen of us who have the public restrooms or two dozen, I don't know how many they are, it's, it's a killer. I, th I think that's a subject for dis discussion um, to determine how we could um, uh, make that work. Um, uh, without a separate meter, it'd be very difficult to determine um, the, pro the proportion. There are 
other ways than um, if there's a separate meter, that means a separate plumbing um, system, which gets expensive to have a separated plumbing system. Submetering might be an option. Um, that's some apartment units um, do that rather than they have a, um, a, a lesser expensive uh, meter to determine the, their um, tenants proportion of cost that can be um, installed in line in the plumbing system rather than having something out in the street that the city uh, would read. Um, I'm just um, kind of brainstorming off the top of my head right now. Uh, I, I think the most simple thing, if it was to be brought up and, and you took that, is maybe you change the classification of those type of businesses. And I know there's not just hotels, but I think I don't know what all businesses have the public restrooms. Um, yeah, I think some of the restaurants do. I don't know if it could be a classification item. It might be the simplest way for all involved. Anyway. I've got a question. Single family homes with a vacation rental permit, are they charged just like single family homes? They're charged like, currently charged like single family homes. Well, I, I appreciate all the work that went into this project without getting into the weeds and you know asking who was on this blue ribbon committee, um, you know, the only thing, shame on you, you know, the, the only comment I have, you know, I, you know, personally, I manage a lot of commercial properties in a lot of different cities, a lot of different areas, counties, et cetera. The cost of doing business in Morro Bay are exceptionally high. You know, it's not just the water that's incrementally higher, it's the availability and the cost of labor, it's the taxes are a little higher. So you put all of these things together, it's harder and harder to do business here. So when these different categories are set, I would just hope that whoever is doing that um, is taking all that into account because, you know, like Chris said, doubling your water bill, it, it, it's hard. It's hard for business owners. So, you know, maybe collectively if we could make a recommendation to look at either requantifying these tiers or just giving more information, because we hear your message, you know, it's a necessity and it has to be done or we're going to get fined 50000 a month. So there's not much choice. But, you know, how do we spread that out so it's fair for everyone? Yeah, my, my only comment, thank you again. I think um, the project is so critical for um, and taking a longer term view. Um, you know, I, I think it's easy for us to look at the tactics of our, our, our bills. It's um, I want to read something to you. Um, Morro Bay is the driest community in the driest region of the state during the driest period in almost 60 years. And every night residents go to sleep not knowing if there will be enough water to get them through the day. The critical time is 7.30 a.m. when a city worker checks the 11 storage tanks that are automatically refilled each night from nearby wells. If any of the wells, which are da at a dangerously low level, dry up, and the tanks are not refilled, the residents may face a crisis of no, absolutely no water. Where do you think this is from? I'm reading an article from the Los Angeles Times written on February 10th, 1991. We have forgotten the last drought, and we've forgotten how close Morro Bay came during that time to completely running out of water. It is so important for us to do this project, and especially the reclamation part of the project, because the worst thing for a hotel is to have no water. And that is not something that we can take for granted. So I so appreciate how you have, have figured out a way to make sure that we can have the reclamation part of the project. But what I want to say is that there's the other part of it, which is, are we doing an economic feasibility study that looks at all of the issues that you brought up. It's not okay to just double a water bill and then say, you know, that, that Morro Bay's tourism is not going to suffer as a result of that. And I, I do think it's very, very important for the chamber and for TBID to be looking at not just the one, the issue on its own. We have to be able to look at, is there any kind of economic viability support that we can give to businesses so that you don't feel that Morro Bay is one of the least feasible places to own and run a tourism business. Our, our economic 
um, livelihood as a city depends on it. So, um, you know, my, my uh, biggest question is, how do we make sure that this issue is being looked at in concert, understanding that we are the driest city in the driest section of the state with potentially no access to state water. So all of these things have to be put together into a recommendation and then to look at, are there funds to really help I mean, are, is there a way to help subsidize some of the businesses, new businesses, or you know, where are we shooting ourselves in the foot by doubling these water bills? Um, so that's my recommendation, is that we take this, this longer term, more macro look at the economic feasibility of doubling our water bills for our businesses. I totally agree with you. At some point in the history of Morro Bay, there were folks who sat up here and said, we have to build a wastewater treatment plant. And that was the one that we're removing now. And there were probably people sitting, so who stood back up and said, that just doubled my, my water bill like eight months later, right? And somebody has to take the hit all the way along. So I hear you loud and clear about pushing down and making sure that we keep it at a, as fiscally responsible as possible and that we're looking at every aspect of what we can do to help people along the way with that. Exactly. So, exactly. Yeah. Our, 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 we don't want to economically shoot ourselves in the foot by dissuading businesses, tourism businesses, to establish and thrive here. We have to make that happen. That's our economic, um, our economic base. But at the same time, we have to have water. We have to ensure that we have the systems to make sure that those businesses are not going to lose business because water gets shut off, which is a possibility in our region especially, more than Santa Cruz, more than south of Santa Barbara. This region is, is one of the... The dry, it is the driest region of California between Santa Barbara and Monterey. So, it, so we have to take that into consideration, but I think we really we have to make sure that we're supporting tourism businesses because our livelihood. I have one last question. Mr. Leibig, can you tell me when we'll be putting a shovel on the ground? Let's break ground. Um, not precisely. Um, I would anticipate probably the middle of March is when we will issue a notice to proceed based on um, information that we've received from the US EPA. What we need to do is finish the um, environmental document to get this, uh, the federal funding. Um, everybody knows about our red-legged frog um, issue, I'm sure. Um, US Fish and Wildlife has issued a biological opinion that uh, uh, basically restates um, what the information that we gave them that we would be willing to do. Um, EPA will be um, receiving a final biological opinion um, the first week of next month. Their program manager says it takes them about a week once they've received that final biological opinion to complete NEPA, um, the Federal um, Environmental Protection uh, Act. Uh, or National Environmental Protection Act, and uh, once that is complete, we can they, we can issue a notice to proceed and not risk uh, um, funding availability. Um, so we anticipate that date to occur sometime in the middle of March. Well, congratulations to staff. I'm you know cheering you on, and I want to see you out there with your hard hats on, and let's get it done. Absolutely. Can I ask one quick clarification? These numbers that we're seeing are in effect right now. I didn't miss. Read. This is not higher than what we're paying right now, is it? Correct. This is what we're paying right. Right. These are the rates that are currently in place, and um, they are currently uh, the rates that will be in place um, um, throughout the project. Okay. Um, seeing as we're already an hour into this and we haven't even gotten to the uh, consent agenda, I'm starting my term off as chair very ineffectively. We're, <laughs> we're going to open this up to public comment. If there's anything the public wants to come address the board that's on or off the agenda, please do so. Maggie. Hi, everyone. I'm, are you, can you hear me? Okay. I'm Maggie Juran, and 
I'm a former member of the TBID board, so I think most of you know me. Um, and I am part owner, and sorry, I have to read because I forget that I forget what I'm going to say. So, <laughs> um, and I am part owner of two vacation rental property manager companies in the area that manage 37 short term rentals in Morro Bay. As most of you probably know, the city is in the process of crafting new STR short-term rental regulations. A committee of which I am a member has been formed to create recommendations that will go to the Planning Commission as input for this topic. The city also reached out to the Chamber of Commerce for their input as well, and, and they now have that, and the Chamber did submit that, a paper with their opinion to the city. As new payers into the TBID assessment, I'm here today looking for your support and <clears throat> for your support and advocacy for reasonable regulations that do not cripple STRs in our city. We are asking the T I am here asking the TBID board to work with us to formulate an independent recommendation for regulations that will help support the continued growth of tourism here. We have been working with the slow cal staff, Derek and, and Chuck. Um, as well, and they have shown us great support so far. We understand that in the minds of some, vacation rentals should be banned completely, but it is no secret that they are a large part of our economy in Morro Bay and contribute a significant portion of TOT, and we are now contributing to the TBID as of January with the stated goal of increasing tourism in our city and putting more heads in our beds as well as the hoteliers. Um, we support a policy that addresses all the behavioral and noise issues in the residential areas, but these need to be balanced with the property rights of short-term vacation owners and the continued economic benefits to the city and to our business, to our businesses that the VR industry brings. I would be happy to work with the task force or subcommittee to provide any data or information that you might need for your input. We, the vacation rental operators and homeowners, look forward to your support and advocacy. Thank you. And, um, and I will be submitting this request in writing, too. Um, but like I say, that's what I'm here for. So we hope we have your support. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. Any further public comment, please? Good morning. Uh, my name is Derek Kirk. We had the pleasure of meeting a few months ago as we, uh, Chuck and I were coming around uh, to renew the San Luis Obispo County Tourism Marketing District. Uh, one of the things that we heard uh, on the visit Slow Cal staff was that we um, needed to be more present in the communities. Um, it is a, a big endeavor of mine. I'm the director of community engagement to make sure um, that you see a face from our organization and our staff uh, present in your communities, hearing what you have, in addition to the work that Jennifer um, little, uh, your tourism manager uh, brings to our marketing committee. So today I'm here to introduce you to Kelly uh, Bricky. Kelly is the communications coordinator and film commission liaison at Visit Slocal. She joined us a few months ago and she is now your official liaison on our staff uh, to the Morro Bay TBID board. Um, and so she will be present at all of your TBID meetings, um, taking notes for us and bringing items back to our staff to make sure that we are following up and, and participating and actively supporting the Morro Bay TBID um, and Morro Bay travel and tourism industry. So not, not here to um, you know, provide a whole lot of input in discussion, but really just to make sure um, that we're hearing your voice because obviously Chuck and I can't be in 12 places um, all at one time. So you'll periodically see myself and Chuck present, um, but Kelly will be your official liaison and um, she's touched base with Jennifer. So anyway, I just wanted to provide that context with you um, and make sure that you um, got, got get to know Kelly a little bit. So thank you so much. That's great. Thank you. Kelly, your primary office is San Luis Obispo? Okay. Yes, I am in the Visit Slow Cal office with the rest of the team. Okay, but you will be here at our TBID meetings when you can. Yes, okay. monthly. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Any further public comment? Seeing none, um, we're gonna, is there any discussion on the board? Nothing? All right. Uh, seeing none, we're going to move on to our consent agenda. Do we have approval of the consent agenda and board meeting minutes from the January TBID meeting? Yes. Um, yes, I move on the con consent agenda that uh, we, do we, 
Take them individually? All together. Does anybody have any comments on or changes to that before I make a motion? Okay, then I move that we approve A1, A2, and A3. Great, do we have a second? A I'll second. second. <laughs> I think it was a tie. <laughs> All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Um, so we don't need to talk about A2? We're good? Okay. Great. Um, A3, approval of middle marketing reports for December and January. I believe you already approved that. We did that, that too? So I think we're on TOT. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're going to look at our business items. Um, December 2019 transient occupancy tax report and year over year report. Perfect. Please. So overall for December countywide, um, the numbers were down. As far as specifically here, our occupancy was at 42%, which was down 4%. Um, ADR was at $116 and REVPAR at $49. Um, some of the influential market factors for December, um, the five days of rain, which um, almost impacted the light of boat parade, not directly, but indirectly. And then there was a decrease in events overall in December, including the tall ships that weren't able to make um, the trip due to repairs and maintenance. Have any questions or comments on the TOT? Questions on TOT? I have a question uh, concerning the lighted boat parade. Mm -hmm. I am don't have an answer. <laughs> That's why I have the question of how to market that in such a way that if the tall ships are going to have a problem or if weather is going to affect parts of the lighted parade, that maybe, maybe my suggestion would be to renaming that event um, so that the event name, if the, if, if the lighted portion is not there on the water, it doesn't feel like the event's being canceled. Gotcha. Because um, two years in a row, that was our worst weekend of the entire year. Two years in a row. Because we advertise it, people book for that specific purpose, then the weather gets sketchy, and they all cancel at the last minute, and then December is a hard month to rebook at the last minute. People have Christmas plans. So... Uh, I'd like to challenge to maybe come up with another name. Okay. You know, Christmas. I don't know. I don't know. Come up with a name so that if that part gets canceled, it doesn't feel like the town is shut down. It's not just that. You get a lot of unhappy guests when there's nothing there that's advertised, right? Right. 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 So it would have to be another event as well. Well, you have a lot going on. You have Santa's workshop. We've talked about bringing in snow. We, mm -hmm. There's a lot of activities going on during that time. But it might just take a few years, and Marianne may have a way of doing that, to, to change people's mindset that they're coming for a lighted boat parade, not coming for the, the half dozen other activities that are there that weekend. Um, and I'll, I'll stop, and Marianne might be able to compound on that. Well, I just have a question for you, because I, I, I think I understand what you're saying is that maybe kind of like the concept of Winterfest, where it was like the 16 days of events. We really tried to push that. Um, Subsequently, we lost grant funds, so we lost some of the events. So, so then this past year, um, we had less to push, especially you know with the canceling of the boat. So, I guess my question to you would be: Are, are you specifically talking about that weekend, or are you talking about? Uh, can you be more specific about it? Uh, yes, I'm specifically talking about that weekend because when you're looking at occupancy rates of 42% in town, yeah. I assume that the majority of that is the weekends over Christmas. Sure. So when you wipe out a weekend, it's a huge hit. So, uh, so that would be that yeah. weekend. Everybody's focused on on the lights and on the boat parade. It, it, so are we over marketing that function of it? Yeah. And you would know better than us. Yeah, I, I think I'd really have to sit down and think about it. I kind of, I, I think I kind of hear what you're saying. Um, it's hard to, you know, we're so dependent on Mother Nature, you know, and so, so some of, some of, you know, it's winter. So, you know, so th that's always going to be be a factor, no matter what we call it. 
is what my feeling is right off the top of my head. But I'd like to maybe take some time with work with Jennifer and, and Megan and, and, and talk that through. I think I think you might have something there, actually. Um, and um, and maybe we talk about including other events that aren't so weather dependent. Um, however, so many of our events are outside, so if it rains, you know, that's another factor too. So, um, but I, you know, I hear you, and and I think we should we'll, we'll discuss it for sure because that it's an issue all around, you know, with logistics and then the people that are you know doing the event and you know and obviously your guys' hotels. So the canceling of the of the weekends of the. And that's that's huge. So, um, so noted, and and we'll discuss it. Thank you. So, for me, I'm looking at this again, and I see a, another month where we've lost market share, where we've lost occupancy, and I'm really concerned. And this isn't necessarily just about December. Us really taking a hard look at December is very important. Don't get me wrong. I, I like what Marianne and Chris are saying. We definitely need to take a hard look at December and look at it holistically to push it up for next year. But to me, I think as we move into the budget phase of what we're doing next year, how we're applying our dollars to the marketing and how we strategically place dollars on marketing next year to drive the message that, that you know, so that we compress Morro Bay, like Nancy was saying, so that it's not vanilla, so that we're really focused and targeting. I think it's really going to be important for us to look back at all of our TOT reports from this past year mm. to see what Jennifer has listed as the market, uh, as what com compressed the market, what was good for the market, and what was bad for the market, i.e. 25 days of rain, one day of rain, seven days of heat, no lighted boat parade, six lighted boat parades, whatever it was that compressed the market so that we can really make good decisions because we can't go through another year of declining revenue with increasing costs. We, it's, inflation goes up, we're spending 3% of revenue here, inflation goes up 3%. Our costs have gone up, some of them have doubled for, for our business community. And so I look at that for you guys, I'm a resident, and how do we as a board help mitigate that in this next budget cycle? So keep that in mind because I'm gonna continue to press on that and hope that we can get the board to focus on that when we move into the next budget cycle. Thank you. And five days of rain relatively is not that much for December. I, I would argue, I think December 2018 was a lot wetter. But we don't look at that. Right, that. right. Um, always try to stay the optimist, but piggybacking on yours, we can also throw in the fact that the economy and expendable income is good. Mm -hmm. So we are shrinking in an economy that's good. It's, we have to rectify that and we'll work harder. Do you need a motion to approve, recommend? Any public comment? Seeing none. Do we need a motion? Motion to receive. Receive and file. A motion to receive the TOT December. December 2019, 18 year to year comparison. Second. A second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay. Moving on. Uh, B2, mid-year review of mental marketing. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Mary Ann Stansfield. I'm with Mental Marketing. And I'm going to do a presentation about the six-month review from uh, July 1st through December 31st for 2019. Um, and a quick review about last year, um, what we did during that period. Um, we, um, well, the board approved the strategic tourism plan last year, actually it was prior to that period, and meant to launch a new ad campaign, Vacation Rules. Um, Hobby One reopened in July 2018. Mm -hmm. There was a huge, you know, the Visit California event in August of 2018, and that pushed our occupancy in RevPAR. 
and we had some really great successes to report. And this year we do too. Um, VR's uh, vacation rentals are, are approved as part of the TBID. Um, we have new events on the horizon for spring, which is great. Actually, one's next weekend. Um, our website is finally uh, gaining and making great strides after the launch last uh, um, April. Um, so that took a couple months to kind of come to fruition. <clears throat> and our campaign numbers are way up year over year. And our social media is tracking like crazy. Really, the referrals are amazing. So how does all this relate to our objectives for more Bay tourism? So let me, is it, there we go. Okay, so, and this was all in your board packet, so I'm, I'm not going to kind of go over every everything in here. Hopefully you had a chance to, to read it over. But um, basically our objectives are on point, and, and they're trackable. And it, they're based on the strategic plan and the ADARA impact results. Um, so first we have, you know, connecting tourism with the local community in a more meaningful way. Um, number two is increase web traffic's and uh, doing that statistically means more bookings. Um, increased demand for lodging means more occupancy. Um, increased ADR, uh, for us, we're going after higher income audience. Um, of no, without new luxury hotels, you know, it can be a challenge. Um, and there are a lot of new luxury large hotels coming on in our county. Um, extend length of stay. Um, we have a benchmark for that for the first time. That was really great. Um, and then, of course, we want to increase Adara Tract campaign generated uh, revenue. And so, how do we accomplish these goals? There we go. Um, well, we grow awareness about what sets Morro Bay apart from our comp set, um, as identified by the strategic plan. And um, we, we've been going gangbusters through PR to do that. And so this is a list of, these are just a sample of stories um, that were focused on outdoor adventure, um, sports and competitions in Morro Bay, wildlife, our seafood, um, and our uh, pristine estuary. Um, we did a big sports push in the spring that resulted in the, um, some great press in the fall. Um, we had um, a post that, uh, from the Mercury News that was posted on the aggregate news site Flip, which, uh, uh, Flipboard, which was fantastic, got us more exposure. Um, we had a syndicated television program called Our California that came and uh, did a, um, a really great um, uh, program based on the Back Bay and going to one of the, um, uh, excuse me, loss of words here, oyster farms, thank you, and then out to the sand spit for our lunch um, and really um, focused on some of the um, fishing um, places, fish markets on the uh, Embarcadero. And um, like I said, it's syndicated. Um, it was a PBS program syndicated nationwide. We're still trying to get the numbers on that, actually. Um, that ran in October. Um, and then we reached out to REI, knowing that they were opening up in San Luis, and we got a blog. They wrote a blog about us. Um, and so about, so that was really um, some of the ways we're really trying to get out there and make sure, create awareness about what set Morro Bay apart from our comp set. And so, so how does this tally? So these are numbers for those, uh, for July through December, um, earned media impressions at 2.23 billion, including two viral stories. One was the baby and the mama otters being reunited, of course. Um, we pushed that out um, to help keep that going out there. And then another one was the paddling witches, um, which was really fun. It got picked up um, a lot of places, and so that was really great. And so the ad equivalency for all that was about 20.8 million. Um, publicity value, um, 33.5. And then uh, social media shares, which I think is really great. It's uh, another form of syndication, if you will. Um, these stories were shared 9,475 times over six months. Um, so those, when people share, they're sharing with their communities, and then they, they share with their communities, and that is, um, that is influencer um, syndication. That's how, that's how we call it, um, <clears throat> which those are some good, good numbers. Um, campaign fund. So um, in July and August, we really want to push, you know, what we need that uh, during that high season, and that's midweek business. We, you know, people are the the weekends are packed. 
Um, we've got rooms midweek, so we still want to keep Morro Bay top of mind to the public. Um, if they want to come during those months, you know, come midweek, better pricing. Also, um, we keep an eye on our length of stay. That's one of uh, our strategies or tactics, I should say, to really try to help continue to grow our length of stay. Um, our next campaign um, was um, Hang with the Locals. That was the wine campaign, Chris, that you were referring to earlier. Um, and, you know, it's the best. Like, when we go travel, we want to hang with the locals. You know, we want to do what the locals do. And so that was our, our focus on that with a call to action, you know, book a stay, get a bottle of wine on us. And um, one of the things and one of the reasons we do at that time is because we're really trying to leverage the value of the statewide wine month of September. You know, want to leverage their messaging that's out there. Um, and um, we also want to focus on another one of our unique differentiators, which is that all of our restaurants here are locally owned and operated. They're not big box restaurants. You know, the, the, the big box restaurants we have are, you know, Burger King, fast food, nothing else. We, we really want to, that was definitely something that was identified in our strategic plan. So that was another uh, focus on that, strategy on that. And then the December um, campaign holiday events. So we don't really, we don't have a strong call, or we don't have a call to action for that month. It's really a branding campaign that we do um, for November and December, because it's all about the events. And we really want to just highlight, you know, you know, come for, come for the holiday, stay for the fun. Um, and so um, one of the things that's really great is that boat parade, because that is unique. That is something that sets us apart from our comp set here in, our, in the county. Um, and even in uh, Santa Barbara, I don't believe, I think the next one is in Ventura or Oxnard to the south. Pardon me? Santa Barbara and Ventura. Santa Barbara has one. Oh, okay. Um, and so, um, but as far as, you know, getting people over here from the valley, that's, you, you guys are getting your rooms booked because we have unique events. And so, um, even though we didn't get the tall ships this year and um, our grant funds were reduced, so we lost several of our, you know, winter fest events like the snow, um, our, we were still ahead, and we were down, but we were still ahead of our comp set um, according to the star reports for December. So we are on a downward trend um, for this past six months. Uh, we're trending down. So, um, and I'll get to that a little more in a minute. So what does all this, oh, I never showed this one. There you go. There's the December one. <clears throat> So what does all this mean? Um, so we're, we use Adar to show our, uh, what our digital, that our digital marketing efforts are working, tracking revenue, and bookings as a result of our campaigns, right? So um, basically, we can show that they pay for themselves. So the media uh, spend, digital and print, for the six-month period was 139000 um, As you can see, the projected revenue at the, on the top line up here, is that my little right here? Um, shows that resulted in 449,000 in projected revenue. So that tracks as a ROI would be three to one. Um, three, three dollars of revenue for every dollar spent on our advertising. I see you thinking, Joan. Okay, uh, if you don't have a question, I'll move on. Um, and while our year-over-year -year actually is not tracking on par, so on the fiscal to, oops, right here, this number, I have an asterisk. So um, we are down uh, uh, about 45% year-over-year on tracked revenue. And I'm working with our, um, with our vendor on what happened there. I know um, one of our flags changed over to a boutique, so, you know, and, and our, this vendor tracks the, boutique, the flags. And so, um, but I've had a couple meetings, I have another one scheduled. So even with our, with our revenue down, we're still, um, pay, it's still paying for itself three to one. Um, last year it was at 90,000. And so that's a big, big change. And I don't, I just, we're trying to get to the bottom of it and it's just taking me a while. So I just want you to know I am working on that. Um, and, um, and as soon as I know more, I'll report to Jen and we'll get that information out to you guys. Do you have any questions on that? I see a lot of eyes like going, huh? I'm following the math real well. Um, this is July through December, so six months. So when I see the number in the fiscal to date, what is that time frame, the fiscal to date? 
Yeah, so it's July to, to December. Okay, so projected, the projected numbers are more than double of that six month period, so I don't. Right, so yeah, so in, in the monthly reports, um, you may recall that I, um, that Adara Impact tracks 13% of our market. So if this is 13, showing 13% 13 of our revenue. I understand. Right, gotcha. and then project it out for 100% would be four. Got it, got it, thank you. You bet. Um, uh, go ahead. Just when we do a, of course. a full year, will we do a full year review? Absolutely. At the end? Okay. Yeah, we'll do an annual report Okay. When at we, the end, yeah. When we do a, a six month comparison or, or a full year comparison, it would be great to have the side by side from that time frame from the previous year. As we as we grow the history, sure. Obviously, we haven't had this going all the way back, right? This is so, the first time we can right. compare exactly. So as we grow the history, to have a comparison to know, show the numbers year you mean? over year, yeah. Of course, of great. course. Thank I'm you. happy to. So we'll do that in the year in the annual report for sure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that. Okie doke. Okay, so we've had some um, data movement that I wanna share. So our length of stay, our benchmark um, as per our marketing plan from last year for the entire year was 1.7. And actually I double checked as well and for July to December of 18 it was 1.7. This year, July to December 19, was 1.8. So it actually ticked up. And how does that calculate out? Um, I calculated it out as if average daily rate is 122, length of stay is 1.7, that's $207 per room stay. Not per night, but per room stay, right? 1.7 uh, days. So at 1.8, um, it actually equals $219 um, per room stay. It's additional $12 per room stay. Does that make sense? If people are staying 1.8 days, so you're increasing each room stay by $12 this last um, six months, which, yay, we've increased length of stay. <laughs> That's good. Um, it's one of those things where it's, <laughs> I know it <laughs> seems small, but it's really huge because year after year after year, we've been saying, oh, one of our goals is to incre increase length of stay. And we assumed for years and years and years it, it was 1.5. And so with this new um, uh, reporting system we have, we actually found out it was 1.7. That's great. Well, now we have a benchmark to, to move it forward. And so I know it's $12 per stay, and maybe I'm making a big thing out of it, but it is kind of big, and we want to just keep going in that direction, of course. Um, so um, the next data numbers, uh, website traffic. Um, I did over three years because last year we launched the new website and it really kind of took a while to get us up to speed. So since um, July or this period uh, since 2017, it's up 11%. Um, since July 18, it's up 2%. Um, we've, we just saw it going positive in November, and both December and January are up 50%, um, and so I think we're just going to really see this um, go gangbusters here um, in this next half of the year. So that's good news. Um, and then I just wanted to note that Moro Vacation, that hashtag we started using about uh, last June, it had only been used 15 times in the history of that hashtag, has now been used um, uh, 1,300 times. So that's about 200 times a month. So we really want to kind of watch that growth of that and see how that catches on in our, in, with, in our, with our influencer market. Um, okay, so trends, trends, occupancy, um, AD, uh, ADR, and RevPAR. So what I did was I aggregated, I have a handout. Okay. I aggregated the star report because I really, I know it's not necessarily um, the whole story, you know, star reports everyone don't, doesn't report out on, but it shows trends in the market within our, our county. And so um, I, we do see, um, so what I did is, you can see the cities down the right-hand side, um, July, August, September, October, November, December, and then the totals at the end there in the yellow segment, uh, Morro Bay's in blue, 
And you can see for this time period, everyone was down except for Atascadero and um, five cities. Is that right? Five cities, yes. So these numbers um, are, I mean, for us, we're only down actually 3%. So, but I wanted to keep our numbers in here with the rest of the group to show the trend that this can identify. So we're not the only ones down, folks. Um, and there's a, so there's a couple things that I think are happening um, in the market. And I think it identifies some of the trends that um, may reflect fears about the impeachment that took place over the last six months, the tariffs in China that are affecting people um, and travel and people being able to leave China. And of course, the coronavirus is a whole other story we won't get into because that's not a part of this report. Um, but that's going to affect us as well. Um, a couple of my takeaways from this is Paso and San Luis have um, huge gains in ADR because of their new luxury prop properties that came online. Um, they had 180 new rooms come online, and their ADR is now 17.65. So, I mean, there is a definite demand for that market. Um, they're down 10%, San Luis Obispo. Part of that, I would imagine, is because they added so many rooms. You know, they still need to grow that demand, but it does seem really low um, to to uh, when Jennifer and I kind of discussed this through. Also, the Paso, the new Paso rooms, they only had 24 rooms come on, so their occupancy being down, um, that is, you know, that is something. I'm not sure if that was necessarily. Um, driven by their new rooms because it was just so uh, so, so few um, and their ADR is down so you know that's it's it's something we're all facing um, so we're right in the mix of that looks like actually looks like a Tascadero pulled the occupancy right from Paso Robles um, that um, uh, Spring Suites Spring Hill Suites in the northern part of a Tascadero has really had really strong occupancy. It's right at the north end there, so it's super close to Paso, and they're just they've got the the numbers and they've got the the um, they've got the rates and they've got the rooms, a number of rooms. So um, um, also, Tascadero is on on slate to have about 330 rooms come on board in the next few years. Um, and then, of course, we have a couple, as, as um, Joan mentioned, a couple of hotels opening up. Not necessarily um, big, huge number numbers of rooms, um, except that one will be kind of big up in North Morro Bay. Um, so we'll see we'll see what happens um, with that. And the Inn at Morro Bay is remodeling their rooms to a more higher end. So um, hopefully, you know, they'll be able to start um, increasing their rates, and I think that'll help everybody. Um, Okay, um, any questions on that before I move on? One quick one. Um, yeah. The San Simeon's really interesting that their occupancy is down 22% and their average daily rate's up over 10%. Did they have a new hotel open up or one Not to my knowledge, not to my knowledge. That's so a big marketing swing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they um, had less rooms and higher rate. But, right, you would okay. think it'd be the opposite, but. Um, okay. I just, you know, there's just... Might just be who's reporting. Would be a, a better guess. Indeed. There's not that many hotels there. There really aren't. Could have had a change in who reported. Right, 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 right. That's, that's a good point. Um, but yeah, the occupancy is uh, just... I, I do think that um, the, the, bus tur uh, the bus tours that go through there, the international market... It might have a lot to do with that because our country has been kind of so unstable with the impeachment and um, people have fears of coming here and um, the Chinese market, the tariffs there, um, they're making it harder for people to leave. And so I think if anybody's going to get hit hard, it would make sense that it's San Simeon because Hearst Castle is such an international destination. Um, that could be part of it as well. I keep, I'm sorry, excuse me. I yeah. Keep, I, <clears throat> I keep hearing that um, we're affected by tariffs, which we are. We're affected by coronavirus. We're, we have, because we have a lot of international travel sure. due to Highway 1. I guess um, I just want to make sure that somehow we're, and this is another strategic question for us, that we're strategically thinking, okay, we have these issues that are happening to us. What are we doing to compress our domestic market? Because we've had a really dry winter. 
So we have the opportunity to steal skiers to come to the beach. I mean, it was 75 degrees here this past week, and it was gorgeous. Yeah. It was a knockout punch for weather. It was yeah. beautiful. And, you know, so I, I just, yeah. and that's a future question, but I, I, or I think it's a future question, but as long as I think we're okay on this chart, this, these aren't true numbers Agreed. because this is a percentage. Right. So these numbers are always a little deceiving to go over. Yes. Not deceiving from you, but from the pool. The pool right, is right. not, you know, it's and this, not. And this purpose was just for trends, but right. yeah. And so, you know, I look at Pismo being up with 124 new rooms. And so it's, it's a little, um, I think, we, I just, I'm wondering, I guess they have new rooms, so you would think, you know, logic is that their occupancy might fall actually because of that, because they're they may not be filling. But it does show that investment is good for a community. So, right. from an economic development standpoint, these are good numbers. From a day-to-day -day heads and beds standpoint, for us, we need to really examine yeah. how we push on those. So I do have a couple comments, and I think that's a great um, uh, point to make. Um, so our marketing dollars go to our drive markets, because you know we have, we're, we're at the bottom of the, t the funnel. You know, Visit California drives and the international market, they're the ones spending the money on the international market. And so when things like you know impeachments and tariffs come into play, I don't know that we have the economic power with our budgets to, to make a difference. So, but what I will say is that our campaign numbers are up year over year. We are killing it with the campaign numbers and the, and the referrals to the website. And our social media numbers are up. If, if you guys have been seeing those, and I've been reporting those out, you know, every month. And so I didn't want to go into the details here on that. So we are hitting, we are hitting our target. People are responding. People are clicking. And they are booking, but maybe they're not booking as much. Maybe, you know, so there is, a, there is something going on, I think, in the travel industry, not only internationally, however, international is, is definitely a trend there. Um, but, you know, and to your point, Chris, the economy is good, but why are people holding back on travel? What is, what is that about? And so I think that's, that's a question we need to have answered. And I'm, and I'm happy to get with Jen and maybe we go sit down with Chuck and, and you know, she's on the marketing committee at, the, at SloCal. And I'm also hammering um, Adara Impact. What is going on with these numbers? What trends are you guys seeing? You know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm like, we're like a little client. <laughs> and so I'm like, listen, this is 8% of our budget. You need to help me with this. What is going on here? And so I have another meeting scheduled with them. And, I, and I'm going to drag it out of them. What market trends are they seeing too? So, so I will have more information for you guys. Uh, because we need to know. We need to know what's, what, what to expect and what's coming. And, and again, the coronavirus hasn't even really affected us yet. I mean, that's, well, you know, I mean, you know, nobody's flying in from China. So, I mean, the numbers are going to, to be affected. But um, that is in a report yet to come. But um, anyway, I just want you guys to know that I'm fighting. I'm fighting for you. And, and we're going to figure this out. So Personally, I wouldn't read too much into the coronavirus and Donald Trump in terms of into the 2019 numbers. I think we're going to see some exceptional numbers January and February. I don't know what you're seeing, but it's been a big improvement from 2019. Oh, yeah. Cool. So. From, from uh, I mean, 2020, because the 2020 whole. 2020 compared to yeah. 2019. Yeah. So I think the gotcha. picture is going to get much brighter in the I, next I agree with you. I think the spring's going to be, we have new events, we, you know, that kind of thing. So right. the impeachment's been put to bed. I just, yeah, I think, I think, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. All right, so um, so where are we? Okay, so wrong way. Okay, here we go, vacation rentals. So I'm going to speak a little bit to what you guys were talking about earlier. Um, so I wanted to um, talk about just some short-term um, trends that we're seeing that we need to that we can act on, um, which is people want good photography on their webs on you know, their vacation rentals are gonna, they're gonna rent. Um, they have higher image quality expectations. Um, the public is looking for more panoramic views and, and that kind of thing. And I know I'm not, I, I don't know, I think Maggie left. Um, I know that's stuff that's gonna have to be, figure, you know, vetted out with, you know, the, the vacation rentals themselves. But I did wanna talk about the media plan and the influencer plan and how we're gonna be going after that market. And 
and quite frankly, um, there's not a lot of um, opportunity, like display ad opportunity, like on a VRBO. VRBO is owned by Expedia. Um, I have been, you know, going back and forth with them, and they are going to be launching display advertising opportunities in a couple of months. They don't have a date. Um, they don't have a, a cost to buy in because at this point, Expedia, to even talk with them, you have to spend 10 grand a month with Expedia. And so I'm hoping that's not going to be the case for their VRBO. Um, that's, I'm in the middle of finding that out. Um, and, that's, and they also own HomeAway, if I didn't mention that. Um, Airbnb doesn't offer display advertising, but they do have a magazine, and they'll write blo you know, articles about you. And so we've already been putting together a series of pitches that we're going to be sending to them on behalf of our, you know, why people should come to Morro Bay, you know, get that on the um, Airbnb site. Aside from that, TripAdvisor, I think, is really where our sweet spot is because they um, have vacation rental inventory and they have vacation rental consumer segment. So we can, they actually have inventory available that we can purchase. Um, we're looking for eight, at about April to get that going for the vacation rentals. So that'll be about four months, April, May, June, three months. Um, of this fiscal to you know start targeting that, working right now with the DAR to see how you know who they track if they track um, Airbnb and if they have partnerships with Expedia, not, which I know they do, but I don't know if they do with the in the vacation rental inventory. So a lot of stuff that's happening right now, but I, I love the discussion you guys had. We can target people that are looking for this segment specifically through TripAdvisor um, right now. Um, so that's probably where we're going to go. Um, what the messaging is, another topic you guys brought up, um, you know, I think that's something for discussion as well. Because if we can figure out a way for, you know, maybe we have all the wine down at the Welcome Center and and whoever gets a bottle of wine, they go to the Welcome Center to pick it up. And so there is a, you know, there's a way to get distribu distribution out there to vacation rentals. So, um, so anyway, working on that. So I have two final things here. Um, we're growing community relationships, like like we talked. It is one of our one of our goals. Um, we have new um, working with the arts community, working with museums, working with the sports community. Um, we worked with uh, and promoted the um, the P520 once that came into town, and this is um, running in Women's Day in Fresno for April, um, promoting all of our great events, and we're really excited about getting some a big push so so that's what we got today folks um, if anybody has any questions happy to answer them any questions or feedback from Marianne I'll be quick because I know time's crazy I had an idea just came to me today oh cool and I'm glad we have slow Cal Hill here also um, I'm no expert on all these numbers that you're projecting but I just want you to know that I have faith that you guys are doing your job and you're working very hard at it thank you I'll throw out an idea to you is there a possibility through your company and or through SlowCal to provide training for hoteliers right. on these items that are available to them? I'm just guessing that a lot of our hoteliers are not aware of a lot of these things that are available to them. Because I don't look at your job as, your job is not to fill our hotels. Your job is to help us fill our hotels. But if individual training could be done on a quarterly basis or yeah. bi-yearly where SlowCal and you are involved and teach people how they can better market their hotels, we yeah. would all benefit. I love that idea. And we've done it for um, DMOs before very successfully. Um, we, you know, created a panel. We brought in our teams. You know, I'm happy to happy to, you know, partner with SlowCal and do it here in, in um, Morro Bay. Maybe that would be the model, perhaps. Um, um, we had a great turnout, um, and we went through the programs that we do, the public relations programs we do, and why we really ne need the tourism partners within the community to connect with us and give us their information. So what's new? What are they celebrating? What's their latest promotion? I know Megan's really great at reaching out and getting everyone's promotions, and we get it on the website. But if there's a, if there's a, um, a media opportunity or a press opportunity, we can, we can help facilitate that if we get that content from you guys. And we all know everybody's wearing multiple hats, you know, in small business. Um, I, I'm one myself. And so... 
Um, it, so I'd love to do that, and, and I'll talk to Jen about it, and then maybe we can make that happen. I think I, I, it was really good, and we felt like the response we got afterwards, because people were able to wrap their brains around what would happen with the data that we would get from them, increased the data flow, increased the communication. And so in the end, I think was very successful. And with a focus of training them on what they can do themselves. I mean, yes. you, you can come forth saying, here's what's working for us. And you might want to try that also. You know, targeting right. so, ads to here. Individual hotels can do their own ads. Right. And so, yeah, it would be, it would, we would cover advertising. We would cover PR. We would cover social media um, and, and so Perfect. forth. Yeah. I, I just want to say thank you. I know I do ask a lot of questions, and you feed back to me, but this is the only time we get to talk to you during the month. <laughs> so as I'm thinking about things as we go along, I, I like to get out there. I just want to let oh, you yeah. know that I appreciate, I appreciate it. I just want you to know, Joan, I'm one of those people, too. I ask a lot of questions. So I appreciate I appreciate when I find another like me. So don't think twice about it. <laughs> Any other feedback? OK. Everybody good? To have a motion to receive and file? Public comment? Second. Public. Second. Public. Oh, excuse me. Nope. Sorry. Public comment? Seeing none, we had a first and a second to receive and file. We don't need it. So I move to approve the <laughs> mid-year review mental marketing presentation. Is that correct? Second. All second. All, all, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? OK. Um, Morrow Bay Visitor Center location. Scott? Back again. All right. So I will try to make this brief because you've had the uh, staff report and the proposal from the chamber. And really, it's about hearing from you, not from me. Um, so quickly go through these slides. Uh, we're talking about 575 Embarcadero as a potential relocation site for our visitor center. Visitor center is currently uh, residing in the less than ideal location on Harbor Street. Um, it is a contract with Chamber. They're doing an exceptional job. However, the location and the amenities and such at that location are, are just less than ideal, and we've seen declining numbers that seem to prove that out um, compared to previous locations near the intersection of downtown Embarcadero and on in an actual Embarcadero location in the past. Um, we also know that there's been declines even after the move occurred, and that may indicate the overall value of a visitor center. So just want to keep that in mind. We don't know. I, I did a survey of my staff and asked how many of them have ever gone to a visitor center. I don't think anybody other than, than used the restroom had ever gone to one. So, But that could just be, I don't know, a, a fluke. I don't know. It's just something to keep in mind as, as we consider the amount of money it would be spent on a visitor center. Uh, here's the location of the back end. Um, obviously, really cool views. Um, this location would bring in more of a user experience. It would capture folks who are down on the waterfront already um, compared to where we are today up on Harbor Street. Um, that, that's just another view of, of the same thing. Uh, and then um, the, the outlay would be about, I think, four or 500 square feet, which would be a, a pretty big jump over what currently have at the uh, the visitor center uh, ADA public restroom um, opportunity for displays that are more user interactive um, more techie and uh, ultimately kind of raise the bar over what we have today in the existing visitor center and this just shows you uh, the proximity to uh, the Embarcadero and the rock where predominantly most of our visitors come and I think the second maybe a first or second most visited location in the entire county of San Luis Obispo. So there's opportunity for capture here and um, to help orient folks to things that uh, help our local businesses, help our lodging industry um, as well. So we as staff, uh, and thanks also to the TBID a, a, a subcommittee on this, um, requested a proposal from the Chamber of Commerce. Um, so it's important to note that that came from us to ask them to submit a proposal on this 575 in Bernard. Embarcadero location. Um, this was after the city had put in a proposal to um, 
to lay claim to the California Welcome Center. Um, we put our hat in the ring and uh, we did lose. Uh, they, they did decide that being Visit Slow Cal to continue to fund um, at the existing site in Pismo Beach. Um, but we did make a really good showing of it and I, I'm really proud of the, the team's effort um, to, to submit a good proposal. Um, but because of the, the nature of all the work going into that, it sort of sp spawned the conversation, well, would we just consider moving the visitor center there anyways? Um, certainly would have liked Slow Cal money uh, up to ninety thousand dollars a year to help fund that but um, nonetheless here's an opportunity to consider so they submitted a proposal you have it um, I think they did a really good job of answering the question we asked them um, I think the numbers they put in there are real and and um, indicative of what it would take to, to up our game um, they submitted that uh, for t-bid review and council review uh, for this month the goals of the proposal and these are my words um, after I read it and sort of have conversations with Erica Crawford, the, the, the ED for Chamber who's here, um, is really to significantly improve the VC experience over our current experience. Uh, significantly increase the number of visitors to the VC um, from our current amount of about 8,000 up to potentially 18,000 um, as, as the years go by. And, and really connect the visitors to the Morabay lodging industry as well as other attractions and businesses. That will help bring additional revenues to hoteliers, to VRs and other businesses, as well as revenues to the city. That's the goal. The terms, uh, again, are outlined in the proposal, but in short, um, there is an outfitting startup cost that would be associated with this move. Um, not, not extravagant, but certainly an upgrade um, will require some, some, some outlays of, you know, in the thirty to forty thousand dollar range. There's a three point two five percent cola increase included for each year. There's an increase in the management fee for the chamber to, to help oversee this. Um, they're proposing an on-site manager that would be there mo almost full time, with a part-time staffer for the weekends and the summer months. Open 362 days a year, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. in the in the more busier times of the year. It would be an ADA restroom, and they're proposing using a contractor to do the cleaning. There's off-street parking option at Shell Shop, and I believe at no cost. Um, thank you, Shell, Shell Shop, for at least uh, verbally committing to that. And then um, proposing an advisory committee of city staff, TBID folks, and chamber to kind of really strengthen the, the triangle around this visitor center and, and making sure it works for all of our, our purposes. Uh, the current visitor center budget is $50,000 a year. That's the city general fund. We don't pay rent because we own the building. It is a modular, in case you haven't been there. Uh, and the proposed budget, I didn't put all f well, I guess I no. There's a, six years if you count this year, but I didn't put the last year because I ran out of room. But the the proposed budget for the remainder of this fiscal year, which includes outfitting, um, yeah, the city general fund amount of fifty thousand dollars, and and if TBID picked up everything, um, it would be fifty one thousand three hundred. These numbers are just what's in the proposal. This is not to say this is how it should be. Just if all things stayed the same um, for the general fund, this is what TBID would pick up. For fiscal year 2021, the total budget is 116,000. Uh, 2021, 22 is 121, all the way down to about 130 when you actually get out in the year 24, 25. So given given that, and I know you hopefully you've all had time to kind of digest the the proposal and really think this through. I mean, there's some high level questions, and there's also some more targeted questions um, that I think you should all discuss. Uh, considering what the investment would be to, to really up the, the game for our visitor center. And first is, should we locate the 575 Embarcadero? That is a very limited opportunity in terms of that specific site. They, I'm sure they have other interests um, from other folks to use that highly coveted retail space. Um, so is there interest in, in moving forward? Are there thoughts on the chamber proposal? Anything in there that you liked or didn't like or things that could be modified? Um, should TBID contribute funds to support a new visitor center? And if so, how much? And are there alternatives to this location, to this proposal, or to, this to the method of how we provide a visitor center experience? Um, 
kind of want it. I know that's a lot to ask, uh, and I'm sure you've all sort of been having these thoughts flow through your mind. Uh, that's how it's been for me, and I realize we're sort of, these are sort of long-term and short-term things, and we've always sort of been stuck with that with the visitor center. We get excited about it, and then there's no opportunity. We haven't talked about it for a while, but now there's an opportunity, and sometimes that begs the longer-term questions, and we get caught in the loop. Um, so I, I, I just want to recognize the challenge of, uh, we all face in, in, in kind of grappling with the short term and long term. But nonetheless, the opportunity is in front of us, and it's really important to hear your thoughts. Thank you, Scott. Thanks. Chris, I think you were on the subcommittee. No. You weren't on the subcommittee. Who, who was on the subcommittee? Well, I met with Jennifer once over this, so I don't know if that meant I was on the subcommittee. I sure. Did that mean I was on the subcommittee? <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was me. Okay, sorry. It was... Uh, Terry and yeah. myself, but Terry is not okay. here today. So. I was involved in early conversations on that site when we were talking about it being a visitor center. And not sure since. Too, right? I think, I'm not sure. Well, can you share kind of just your two cents on location mm -hmm. availability? I can. Um, I think the location is fantastic. I think the location is, is wonderful, and I think the numbers of increased visitation are low. I think the visitation will. 10 times, 20 times be what it is now. I think it's next to nothing now and I think it'll be enormous amount of visitation. A um, couple of thoughts I want to add onto that. Well, while we're talking about visitation, I do not know though in today's environment if that visitation is going to equate to beds and heads, heads and beds. That's the, the question. You know, they can come in, I think people are curious, they can find out about things going on, things to do. Are they going to change their plans? while they're already in town and say, ah, why don't we stay while we're here? Or why don't we stay another day? I think that might even be a more viable answer of, oh my gosh, I didn't realize, you know, uh, Montana de Oro is just right down the street. We should do that tomorrow. Let's see if we can stay another night. So I don't have the answers to those questions. I think visitation, fantastic. Look for the city, fantastic. Will it equate to enough heads and beds to justify the expense? That I don't know. Um, one side item on that, on your costs, if the city was to get involved in this, I think there's a potential also for you guys to negotiate a better lease. Um, usually for city entities or large scale corporate businesses, they can get better um, lease rates. So I don't know if that's been, I don't think you're to the point of negotiating, but do throw that out. They feel comfortable with that those people are going to pay. Um, and that could save a few dollars. But those are my thoughts on this. Super, thank you. And just to clarify, the city owns the land, not the building, correct? We'll go with yes. Joan can explain how complicated it is to answer that in, in, in truth. Um, but we, it, it's Tideland's Trust. It's in the city's names now. Right. We own the land. Somebody else owns the, the, the complete building. We would be paying rent for that. But is the property owner paying a lease rate for the land, I would think. They, there's a, um, a contract with the city. I don't know how, long, how far they end into theirs. Um, you know, some leases have 50 years, some have less. And so they pay a per percentage of, their, of the earnings of the overall building to the city. Yeah. Sounds complicated. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Any input? So since um, it's been about a year that I've been on the TBID board, and one of the first things that we did was meet to talk about the visitor center. And, um, and because I travel so much for business, I sort of over the last year made a little ad hoc study of visitor centers in every city that I go to. Um, so at some point, I'd love to share, because what I was seeking is what are best practices of vis visitor centers? Um, what are their success metrics? Um, <clears throat> and um, what I've seen over the last year are the visitor centers that become just a place to give printed material are extremely unsuccessful and they make very little impact. In fact, when you walk in, as a personal experience, you walk into this room that smells of degassing printed material, and you immediately would just want to use the bathroom and leave, right? So, uh, so I think what, what I'm most interested in is visitor centers that are successful are focused first and foremost on the visitor experience, not on um, being a center for the, for, the, the, um, for what the community wants to try and sell. 
Um, so in other words, you know, it, it becomes an experience for the visitors that really highlights that as soon as the person steps in, they say, this is interesting, I'm glad I came. And um, so that's, that's what I want to, I want to know that, and I want to know what are the ways, what's the plan for making it a best practice visitor center, not into the worst practice? Um, and, um, and then what are the success metrics? I would think that beds and heads for current visit are, will be low. But, but, excuse, yeah, yeah. Heads and beds. Heads and beds. Heads and beds. Uh, beds and heads, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Heads and beds. Heads, oh, well. Heads and beds. But, but, what, but maybe it is a vehicle for repeat future visits, you know, repeat visits. I don't know. That's, that's really what I want to say. Well, see. it's not going to hurt, right? Yeah. Yeah, um, so that, I think that's that's one of my, my questions. But I can tell you that just quickly, the, the visitor centers that I've visited around the world that are best practiced, in my opinion, one is the visitor center in London on Carnaby Street, which as soon as you walk in, you feel like an insider on Carnaby Street. It introduces you to local artists that you might not find if um, you didn't know, and they sell things that point you towards you like this, there's more at this store down the street. So there's this virtuous circle that's created between local businesses and the experience that you have there. You can purchase things in the visitor center. It has its own shop, which is very lively and exciting, whatnot, but if you want more, you can go to another shop that they point you to. And so um, I'd love to hear what the ideas are for making this a great experience for the visitors, not just a place where we store lots of printed material, which is, and we have a bathroom. Okay. Is that more a question for chamber or for city, you think? Um, so it might be a, a follow-up. I don't know if you have follow-ups planned for the, the, for the chamber or, uh, or if um, this is something that we pick up with, um, I pick up with Jen. I'd, I'd be open to suggestions. Yeah. Sure. Thanks, Erica. Sure. Thanks, Erica Crawford with the Chamber. Um, I think the, as far as down that path that we got was the concept of the Maid and Morro Bay area and the um, live like a local sections within the space and also the um, mural. I was in touch with the Forever Stoked gentlemen who are going to do a custom because the ceilings are really quite beautiful with lots of natural light. So we asked them for a general ballpark estimate on what it would cost to do something like that. The idea is that everything there, that's why the build out cost is a, maybe a little bit high for cabinetry. We're thinking everything in there is made in Morro Bay. So it's a, it's a real, it, it is an experience. Um, and that was, a lot of that was thanks to the effort that we went through starting last February to to conceive of the ideal state of the visitor center and to have conversations about what is the ideal state of the visitor center. So. Great. Great, okay. thank you. Yeah. So I have a question. I think it, my understanding would be problematic to try and merge that location to be chamber and visitor center because chamber works for chamber members and not all business. Is that a correct analysis that I'm giving there? Or, or what would be the what would be the conflicts of having Chamber of Commerce involved in that location also? Well, the Chamber of Commerce currently runs the visitor center, and we represent all businesses. Anyone who's a, a business in the chamber or in the city is welcome to display materials in the chamber, and we refer visitors out to all businesses in the community. The visitor center is funded through general fund money, so we are we are not restricting our recommendations and our referrals to chamber members only. Does that answer your question? So, so maybe I, I'm so just understanding, so would we're the not chamber in a, be involved in the new location? Would that be your new location? Like, would your office be in the no. new spot? Uh, no. As you can see from the layout, this would be a remote location. This would be a visitor center only. There's no office space built into the layout. It's a. Re it's the same thing, just a mm -hmm. remote location. Okay, and so the staff that would be, be hired, they would be hired by... The Chamber of Commerce is the uh, the service operator. We're we're operating this the same same way right now. Checks are being written by the chamber. And so partially chamber funded employees. by TBIT is what's the mm -hmm. proposals can. The proposal conceives of yeah. I mean we we tried to build it out. This is what it would actually cost to do this. We answered a very specific question, and I think that's what we. That's what I've talked about with staff and talked about. I think Joan and I had a conversation about this, um, and my board too. It, it's tough because we're the visitors that we've been talking about for a long time. We were asked to propose 
how, you know, how to operate a visitor center in this location. And even in our board meeting, when we considered the proposal, we were running all around, well, what about, what about, and asking all these other questions, and we had to come back around and say, we're, it's just this, lo it's this proposal. How does this proposal feel? How does this sit? So we had to stay really narrow in that. Um, so, so the question that you're answering, it would be the same, or asking, uh, the same way that we're running our staffing now, i.e. the chamber is writing checks and funding is coming in and all funds are expended out when we take an administrative fee that covers um, various costs of managing the contract. Right now it's $7,200 a year. This conceives of $12,500. That's it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and with the board here, no matter how good some of this sounds, I think our responsibility is with TBID dollars is how it's going to help the tourism business and the and the hotels and the vacation rentals, we have to wipe our mind on how much it may help restaurants and how much and that's a, a side benefit. But if we don't see fifty to seventy thousand dollars of benefit, yeah, I then don't know it, how you would track that. Well, and more than that, I, we couldn't. Mm -hmm. But even more than that, because your taxes paid upon it, that's what we have to yep. mm -hmm. figure out. So, hmm. do you want me to stay up or go down? Uh, well. Stay in the vicinity. What's that? You can stay in the vicinity. That'd be great. I might stay. In the, oh yeah, I'll stay. In the so I once I got the packet, I I read this with great interest because I've seen lots of iterations of the visitor center over the 20 years I've been a resident in town, um, and I do think that the chamber staff is doing a great job of shaking the hand of the visitor and getting information into the visitor's hands when they come into the visitor center, no matter where that location is. Doesn't matter where that location is. Um, so simple question is absolutely, visitorship will increase if you put it down on the Embarcadero. No doubt about it. It would also increase if you put it on Morro Bay Boulevard or Main Street. No doubt about it. It would increase if you put it in City Park. You betcha. So is it going to increase if it's moved? I believe it will. It would increase at Highway 41 and Maine. Uh, but I think that the conveyance letter from the chamber really, really did a great job of spelling this out, as in we were asked to look at one location only with a very narrow scope. So the very first question I have then is, is this the right location for the community? Um, remembering always that this is about the guest. It's not about Nancy or Joan or Stephen or uh, the Pleasant Inn or the Galley restaurant. It's about the guest experience, right? Then I started thinking, wow, we're going to have a really, really superb state-of-the-art visitor center, and then what happens to the rest of our product that we're putting out there with our guests? We don't have matching banner flags throughout the community. We've got like three different banner flags on the Embarcadero right now. Nothing matches. There's a crosswalk that's partially painted. You know, so are we living through then on that very first initial guest experience all the way through what they're doing in our community. So there's all these bigger, broader questions. And then there's the budgetary question of 650-ish thousand dollars over five years. Most of which would come, well, all of which would come from the general fund and TBID funds per this current proposal. So I, I met with Scott because I wanted to um, convey this, I don't want to convey this in a negative way, I want to convey the message out in a positive way, that I do think we need to do something with our visitor center, but I'm not sure that $650,000 over five years, that location is the right thing. Because remembering that if we pull $75,000 out of our budget for this, that's going to be $75,000 removed from the marketing area of our budget. It's not going to be able to come from the reserves every year. Can't come from the reserve fund. It can this year because we're in a rush and the reserves are high, but 
that's not, it's going to come from the operational budget, period. So we already have some static costs in there with staffing and other things that are not going to go down either. And I have a concern that I don't want it to hit what Mary Ann is doing as she tries to build momentum for us. That's why I really wanted to see the TBID overall budget and how it would be affected over the course of this come back with this. But what we have is the number of $650,000. I'm inclined to say I would rather see us because we have an option in here of giving another idea. My other idea would be for us to say, you know what? This was a great proposal in this location when we were going to have $90,000 coming in to help support it from Visit SloCal and Visit California. But let's maybe go back to the chamber and see if they would partner with our community. Let's use maybe 10 or 12, maybe $15,000 of our reserve funds this year to have the chamber do an economic feasibility study of the future for a visitor center for our small community, right? How maybe they could pull partner community chambers into it so that we could become a North Coast Regional Visitor Center with an eye on Morro Bay, and what different mechanisms might be available for funding it. Because in the report, it shows that only about 18% of folks who come into the visitor center are asking for lodging, and that's all types of lodging. That includes camping at our state campgrounds who don't pay TOT in to support our community, right? So and I am concerned that uh, uh, removing a big chunk of money like this from our budget without us really taking a hard look at are we doing the right thing just because this location is available today. Because locations come up along the Embarcadero all the time. I mean, there's another location two blocks down, or a block and a half down. So, so I, I really want to we'll make sure we're making an educated, well-rounded decision. Because this is so important to our community, that's a lot of money for this small town. So, so, John, are you saying that you would be in support if the deal points were different and TBID was contributing less? Or you just want to analyze the entire situation and take a step back at this point? I'd like to take a step back and analyze the entire situation mm. because I think there's other ways of funding this, too. So what are the available mechanisms for funding this? Mm -hmm. I had a conversation with Scott, and I'll put it right out there. There's somewhere between 500 and 1,000 business licenses that are pulled every year. What would it look like if every business license had a, and I don't know if this is legal, that would be a question for legal, but we don't know because we haven't asked it. If every business license had a $25, because every business in town is touched by tourism, the dentist, everyone. They're not touched directly by the tourist, but they're touched by tourism in this community. So what would it look like if they had a $25 or, I don't know, maybe a less or more? It would have to be looked at. Line item that said visitor center administration. Business, the business side of the visitor center administration on there. So well, that we all helped pay. Yeah. Well, maybe not the service industries, but definitely restaurants, retail, right? I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I just threw that out there as, as a net conversation catcher. What conversations can we have? We haven't had any. So okay. uh, I'm inclined to say let's focus more on how we're doing this to make it right. Because I believe that visitorship can be increased through a visitor center. I believe that the future can be compressed by a visitor center. And I believe that our visitor center staff in our chamber is doing a good job. And I believe that our city staff is working hard to figure out how to link all of this together. Mm. So I think in order, we've been working here and here and here in kind of silos. Let's push that all together and make a comprehensive plan for this, just like we did, made a, a 10 year mindset path to tourism success. This is part of it to me. So I'm inclined to hold off. Okay. Any further discussion? 
I, I actually agree. I think that um, you actually explained to me why, I, one of the questions I asked was, why have we had so many different visitor centers even since they first started visiting Morro Bay? And I think a lot of it might have been. It's, it's driven by, oh, there's a place available, let's rent it. <laughs> and the, the, the bigger plan isn't in place. So in, in answer um, to your questions, I, I think I would also really like to see a much more holistic plan about you know, not just reacting to a space is available. And, in terms of the TBID funds to support, <clears throat> and if how much, what amount, I think it does need to be in align, more in alignment with the success met metrics of TBID um, in order for us to support it. And I think the amount is too high. For uh, I, I work as a docent at the back desk of the Natural History Museum, and so I work as a sort of ad hoc visitor center person because of working, volunteering at that bath desk. Um, I've never had anybody ask me where to stay. I always have people ask me where to eat, where to buy things, where to, you know, but I've never had anybody at, ask me um, or where to go or where to hike, but never had anybody ask me where to stay. So I think, um, because they're already here. So I think that the contribution of TB should be more in alignment with how um, the visitor center is actually going to drive heads in beds. There Great. we go. And I agree with everything both of you said. I do. So is staff looking for a formal recommendation for city council? Um, I think we can roll with what you gave us. I, I think, um, and just to, to shed some light on this, um, what this would mean, um, the current visitor center is not worth the amount of money we spend. Okay, and I think Erica can attest to that. It's not, again, about the chamber at all, not about her staff. They're amazing. She's a great manager of her staff, but, you know, we're paying for people to come in to that, to that space. And um, so, you know, if we're going to do this, I just don't want to be in an endless loop because we've seen to be in this. We, right. oh, you know, just look, oh, it's, it's too much. Well, it's always going to be too much. But I understand the funding strategy, making sure there's alignment. There's, there's work to be done. Um, I do worry about our ability to do that because I have um, completely calendared out the year for, for num another, uh, number of other priorities. And we were hoping this would be the one that could actually get through. Um, but I understand the, the concerns and, and the obstacles we face um, and don't want to rush things. But I just want to put that out there as, you know, a realistic check that we as staff may not be able to turn something around quickly, however we sort of need to, right. because another year of inadequacy in the visitor center is a problem. Um, and again, not chamber, there's nothing they're doing wrong, it's just the location and, and just maybe the model and, um, you know, so can we do this quickly, I guess, is sort of what I would... Can you foresee any type of modification of the proposal that would put less burden on TBID if we're not seeing the overall benefit, it sounds like? I mean, that potentially, I think the same same issue would probably apply. Um, you know, the general fund is also hit, you know, we're, we're in a similar bind of like really focusing on strategies and, and, and priorities and is this... Is this where we want to, right. you know, are we gonna, willing to take on another fifty to sixty thousand dollars? I think the uh, slow count money made things really appealing sure. because it, it was like, well, that's it's not free money. Remember, we're, all of our folks pay into that, but it just it was another pot of money we hadn't ever considered. So it it certainly made a, everything easy. And I think that sort of put, pushed us on this path to maybe fast track this up from a different funding mechanism. So um, I don't know if Erica has anything to offer. Uh, Beyond that, would it help? Yeah. Would it help yeah. if if would it help if our I, because we don't have a our, I guess we could uh, Erica can't really answer for her board today right. about whether they would be willing to do a, a comprehensive visitor visitor center feasibility economics different funding mechanisms what's being done out there by other folks right. She can't answer for her board today, right. but would it help if if we uh, m made a recommendation with like up to yeah, I, I up, would up to I, money or anything right? I, I would there if, if you're rolling? if you're looking for the recommendation to include chamber, I think Erica should at least weigh in. I know she can't answer for her board, but at least yeah. is right. this with because I'm giving you the straight about what my 
our capacity is and also the timelines that we're looking at just because we've been talking about the visitor center for several years now and i know you know and that's why I'm concerned about yeah. the money, because it can't yeah. come from the oh. general fund either. Right. So I just I have a, that. a quick sure. comment from Jennifer's watching, and she texted me. Um, <laughs> her comment um, is that uh, I guess uh, Chris and she did look at other uh, locations um, and before deciding on this one. It wasn't the only one they looked at. But the other thing, and more importantly, is that there is going to be an additional 160000 a year from the vacation rentals coming in. Uh, so just just wanted to mention that. Erica, you have something? So I'd be happy to bring a new question to my board to answer. Um, and I think that's probably the best. The, the, more, the more clear you can be um, on what your anticipation, a feasibility study or an economic study doesn't give me clear direction. So I'd, I'd really want to know exactly what you want to see what data points, you know, if there's a, a set of comparative um, tourism destinations and city sizes and things like that. Just the more detailed you can be, the the more efficiently we can work um, and the better I can pitch and, and assemble a working group. And then one of the things that I liked about this effort is that it did, you know, the, the triangle, as Scott said, you know, to be more strategically aligned with TBID is something that I would love for the chamber and the city and the TBID to be far more strategically aligned. And I think that the TBID's role in getting visitors to the destination and the chamber's role in making sure that the destination is strong and that our visitors understand how to experience the destination is a partnership that we need to improve, um, frankly. And so I think that this kind of an effort working together, I think, will be really positive for the whole city. Good. Thank you. I, I think hands down it's a better location. It's just a, you're right. It's just a matter of, you know, if there's an 18 percent benefit for TBID, and we're being asked to pay half the bill, more than half. So if, you know, hearing what my board is saying, it sounds like we would like a modification of the proposal to some capacity would help. Is there any public comment? Any further public comment? And maybe we as TBID need to discuss again. Maybe it can be an item on next month's agenda, and we can spend this next month coming up with some ideas and, and investigating this individually, because I'm curious about it. But the, the big piece I'm missing is the TBID dollars, are they well spent? I mean, that, that's the piece that I don't have the confidence in. I don't have the knowledge to, to back that. Yeah. The, I love the location. I think yeah, it would help I the city. I, I want to agree with Chris. Oh, I, I think I'm being asked to, I, I think it, it's quite an investment. It's quite a chunk. It's being taken out of other things. Um, and um, I want to know what, what are we looking for it to move? I mean, if, if a visitor center will help drive length of stay, stay, that's the metric we're going to drive with it. Great. Then I, you know, then I have a way of judging what we want to see from the visitor center. As I said, in the best practices, when I asked, you know, other uh, visitor centers, what are some of the best practices? They all said it, it has to be thought of as engagement. Physical location is not, and printed, printed pieces are the old way of thinking about a visitor center. A new way of thinking about a visitor center is it drives engagement, and it drives engagement through a partnership between physical location and virtual. So it's, it's, it's uh, smartphones, driving you to different locations. It's, so it's thinking of it just as we need a physical place. That's an old way of thinking about a visitor center, that you're going to drive traffic to a parking lot. That's not the way best practice visitor centers think of themselves now. They think of themselves as a partnership to engage people through a partnership of virtual and physical location. So that's the kind of thing I want to hear, and um, uh, is how how is the space going to drive engagement? And then how is it going to drive specifically TBID-driven metrics, um, like maybe length of stay or future visits or whatnot? And that's what I really need to see to make a decision for and, TBID. And this. for the community, for me, for the community, I, I want to know that our general fund dollars, because the, if 18% or 30% or whatever the number is comes from TBID, that number comes from TBID, but the rest of it so far historically has come from the general fund. So for me as a resident, I would like to know 
is there another matrix, funding matrix, that we can use? Are there practices out there for another funding matrix? Because I would love, quite frankly, to see the general fund dollars from the visitor center go back to the general fund to support all of the projects that Scott's saying are demanding on staff right now. So is there a way to do it virtually that causes that to go back there? Because as a resident, I, you know, I would like to see some of the street striping moved up or whatever it is, you know? So, uh, so for me, if we're going to study this, which I think we should recommend that we look harder at the entire, organically at the entire picture for a visitor center, then those things, we, we need to drill down on what those things are that we want looked at. And that's probably next meeting or. Yeah. You know, obviously the space isn't gonna stay vacant forever. So if it goes away, it goes away and everyone's fine with that. I think we had further public comment as well. That has to be the least important. I just wanted to throw in, because um, timing is of the essence. You know, the uh, visitor center contract as it stands now will expire on June 30th. So I do think that this effort, because it, it's going to feel real big, um, so to try and figure out what the question is that we're answering in, a, in an efficient, quick kind of way is, is really important to me um, Yeah, in the next couple of months. And okay. Erica, I want to say thank you to you and your board. Oh, yeah. Because you put a lot of work into this. And yes. thank you, Jennifer. I think you're watching at home. <laughs> Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer. Um, thank you to you and your staff. I see Megan over there on her birthday putting up with this. Um, for all the hard work that you've put in on this. Because I, I know it's been a lot of work. I, yes. It's been a significant amount of work. So thank you very much for yes, everything. Because it's spurred a good conversation mm. and our community might be able to move to the next level from this which could be really really positive so thank you for All right that. hi thank you any further public comment seeing none uh, declaration of future agenda items visitor center matrix hold, hold I, I think if you want uh, chamber to go back with some are you going to wait to have your meeting next month to, to what do you mean go ahead I don't do you want chamber, do you want st staff to carry forward a recommendation to council to say, chamber, can you go study these things? Uh, so we do that yeah, I would, I would do that today as opposed to waiting. So. Make a motion to. Are you looking for a motion, Scott? Yeah, I think, I think at this point it'd be helpful. And, and as Erica indicated, more the more specific, if, if I understand it's hard to do and it's a, a global topic, but you know, because you could spawn off a $200,000 study or a $20,000 study depending on the questions you're seeking answers to. So, some of the, com the comments that I've heard from you all are best practices, right? Best location. I, I, I would do it without location. Okay. We have to figure out what what benefit could be done, what T-bid contribution could create the benefit of the visitor center? And what's the return benefit to our community? Kind of Mic that microphone. Oh. Um, I think we need to leave the location out of it. Okay. And instead try to determine what a T-bid involved, what T-bid's involvement should be in this. And can we do our best to quantitate the value back to tourism, back to that term again, beds, heads and beds. I mean, that's what we have to determine from our position here. Okay, so um, best practices, uh -huh. funding success, matrix. Success metrics for TBID. TBID, TBID, uh, quanti quantitative funding. Yeah. TBID, what's the words here, folks? We need to justify need our words. involvement. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. we need to justify the expense. Even success metrics. What is it going to drive, and how are we going to use it to meet, to meet our goals? And then, secondly, Microphone, then oh, sorry, and then and then six, the TBID success metrics for the visitor center, and TBID measures, and then our investment to get those results. It's a business issue because the the current amount. The, of TBID's um, contribution is, I think, higher than we are the return. 
So we'll. Okay. Do you want to try and put that into a motion? Um. Yes, but do we want to involve, uh, do we want to, the port, I think my microphone is on. It, oh, sorry. I think that, <laughs> I think that the, the other thing that we need to include as a resident, because there's general fund money involved here, mm -hmm. the other thing that we need to include is the economic impact of a visitor center on the overall community not just on TV. It's really important yeah. to understand what those matrix are for everyone, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I don't mind seeing when, when and if TBIT funds this, and I feel very strongly that we should, if there's funding that needs to come through to support a project like this, then I think that we, we definitely need to include the overall, mm -hmm. okay? Absolutely. So, um, so I have best practices, a funding matrix, TBID measures, and su success metrics. Do you want to make a motion that... Is there anything else that we should add to we make We ask the chamber to discuss these items and then come back to us with a response? Shh. Or ask chamber to make a proposal to do, to study these items, to really bring back. I understand what she's saying about June is coming up very quickly, right? But perhaps a shorter length as whatever length of time the study is going to be, then perhaps we could fund a visitor center continuum in that short period of time. In other words, if they need six months to study this until October or something, then you know, fund the visitor center up to that point till we have a definitive answer. Why don't we just put the challenge? I'm going to say this right out to the chamber to bring us an alternative proposal, a, a big picture proposal, and we can then put dates to it after that. Let's let's start, you know, one step at a time. But I know you're still asking what you're going to put together. And I'm looking at Erica with her <laughs> eyes wide open. This has all come so it. quick. This all started I know. with California tourism, you know, California Welcome Center. So my board doesn't meet again until the third Tuesday of March. Um, so the more clarity I can get from you and then whatever council will be discussing, because I think, right. you know, I, th I think you need to make a recommendation to council and they're going to hear it on Tuesday. Is that um, microphone on? Is my, oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Um, so yeah, it, that, I just want to give you a sense of our timing is that our board will meet the third Tuesday of March, um, and I, I, the more direction you can give, the, you know, that, that, that's what I need. I can't just go and say, hey guys, we're going to write a proposal on the global issue of visitor center financial impact. Um, that, I don't think that that will go well. I think we're just looking for some justification that what we're being asked to um, pay, provide, is going to, you know, have a return. I don't know return. that the response, I think it's a discussion for my board to understand that the responsibility for producing that data lies in the contractor providing the service for the city. Right. You know what I mean? Uh, okay. the, the chamber is a contractor to provide a visitor center. So I just, if I'm asking, right. you know, we also have staffing constraints and goals and objectives sure. to deliver. So we just need to be really clear on how we're all working together to solve this problem in our community. Right. Right, and, and please rem remember you're directing the recommendation to council, yeah. and you can say you, we we recommend that council consider requesting okay, gotcha. the chamber to do X, Y, and Z, and then um, council will do take that recommendation and accept it or modify it, but it's important to hear what you want council to do. Okay. Yeah. Or would recommend that they do. I know. Is the board interested at all in having a comparisons of a, of a couple of like-sized coastal cities? So what are other coastal cities that are just 10,000 folks that are visitor serving? Are they even having a visitor center? I mean, Capitol yeah. is 11,000 people. No. No? See, there you go. So what's maybe, ha it would be interesting to know from a couple of different perspectives, why they don't have a visitor center or why they do. So I don't know, I'm just saying that. So, so what I'm hearing from staff is that, and then from the list from the board, 
right? Mm -hmm. Are we okay? Is that you're making a recommendation? Staff is making a rec or what, no. The board would like to make a recommendation to city council Correct. to ask the chamber to, to request that the chamber study, uh, do a study on visitor centers, including best practices, funding matrix, uh, the TBID uh, measures and matrix for success, and funding proportionally and a comparison of or a small sampling of what other like size communities coastal communities are doing in terms of do they have a visitor center or do they not communities of 10,000 folks ish do you have a second a second Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Mm. Sorry. That's a tough one. That was a mouthful. <laughs> okay. Um, future agenda items? Right. Just want to be sure. Declaration of future agenda items? So we had Maggie speak at public comment? Mm. I don't know. If we want to support that or not, I'm. I have a question for staff on that. The vacation rental. It's not a regulation. What is it called? The vacation rental overview. What is it? Is it? A the you mean the ordinance? Ordinance. Thank yes. you. Yeah. The vacation rental ordinance that's coming forward. We're not a regulatory board. We're a marketing board. Right. We're really. Is that our? Do we weigh in on stuff like that? Is that something that's in our purview? You can. Um, it, since you now have, uh, you're, you're partnered up with the vacation rental community and you have a, a board seat, um, you absolutely can review the ordinance or the kind of overarching policy that would come forward from the committee. That's something that this board could sort of say, we think this is a good thing or we don't have an opinion or we think it's bad. I mean, there's no reason why you couldn't do that because you are now part of, they are part of the, the TBID. Now, it, there are some cities that only run their vacation rental policies through the planning commission and council. Some you know, run them through economic development um, subcommittees or, or committees of council or advisory committees as well, just to understand the economics side. So that could be something this board does. I think I'd feel more comfortable if your negotiations with the vacation owners and city council, if you had a list of questions that you wanted to run by us, I would feel better if they came that direction instead of us endorsing Maggie's and their plan now. I think it, I'd feel comfortable if it came Are you that close way. to having that done, the plan? Um, I don't even know where it's we, at. We've met, uh, the committee's met about <coughs> eight or nine times in the last three months, four months, and winding down the work in the next I would say next couple meetings we should be done, which means it would see the light of day in planning sometime in uh, April. And planning commission can they they actually are regular. They absolutely have to because there's a zoning components and they they are the body that recommends or makes decisions on zoning. So they they have to they have a regulatory component to it. Whereas TB would be an advisory and you know if if it felt so inclined to, to consider it. But then in terms of how that would work, wouldn't it be after them? Because then it would be pretty much set, and then it would go to council? Because we can't really change anything. No, you them. can't. You could just provide comments. Right. Right. Okay, so whatever you want to do now that we So future agenda item, nothing? I wish Terry would. She's not. Can we wait and ask Terry next time at the next meeting? If I think we're just declaring future agenda items. So no, there's if nothing she wants it to be a future agenda Right, so if we're not going to yeah. declare a future agenda item, there's nothing to do. Yeah, I mean, you would, in theory, be able to make it to your April meeting if next meeting you all decided to make it a future agenda item. It could probably still work timing-wise. Okay, anything else? Maybe. Going once? All right, thank you, everyone. Meeting adjourned, 1149. Have a good day. Yeah.